To the Weekly Stuff podcast with Jonathan Lack and Sean Chapman. We are here to talk about stuff after a, uh, a little week off because Sean, you were busy. Yes, I, it was something where on Sunday I was looking at the amount of time I had. And I was like, I just do not have the time to record a three-hour podcast. Okay, like, this is we we are we have to postpone this. All right, well we postponed it, uh, but that means this week we have a bunch of fun and one not so fun things to talk about. Yeah, um, we have uh, stuff. Like, I'm going to talk about some adventures with Doctor Who and Stardew Valley, and you're going to talk about Star Wars Battlefront 2 beta and other things, yeah. and we have a bunch of movie trailers to talk about, yeah. and we have some gaming news, and then we have this horrible thing with uh, rapist extraordinaire Harvey Weinstein, so that's going to yeah. be, we have to talk about that a little bit. Uh, and then we have to talk about Blade Runner 2049, yes. which we have not conversed about yet, No, other than you have kept up your Blade Runner shrine. Yes, it, it felt it felt necessary. Okay. And also, it just would have been more work to put it all back in the box, really. <laughs> All right. The other part. Um, so we talked about that. I love this movie. Um, I love it. You guys have heard my thoughts on it. I don't know what you thought about it. I, I have kind of mixed feelings about it. I think there are things about it that are like unimpeachably amazing. I think like everybody knows like the visuals and the cinematography and like the editing like that stuff is really remarkably good. But I do have some issues with the storytelling in the movie in different areas that I don't know. Like part of it is kind of like personal things that I don't love. Some of the direction they go in with the main plot. And other stuff is that I think the the some of the storytelling is a little messy to me. Okay. But overall, I think it's a very good movie. Okay. That especially like I can understand why people have like the really extremely positive reaction they have to it. Yeah. So you're not like down on the movie. No. 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 Okay. That's cool. I mean, especially like let's just like while we're doing spoiler free talk on it. Yeah. Like whether you love it a little mixed. Two years ago, like when this was announced, did you expect it would be this interesting? No. Yeah. As a sequel, like whatever issues you have with it, like it is a it is a movie that kind of aims for the stars, and whether you think it comes up short or not, it is like intellectually and artistically engaged in a way that a 30 years later sequel to Blade Runner, you would not have expected. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I keep getting people like, you know, or I hear about people like, why is this movie not doing well at the box office? And it's like, because it's kind of a faithful sequel to Blade Runner. And, sure, in some ways, yeah. And that's not going to do well at the box office. Like, it's a three-hour, heady, artistic sci-fi movie with big ideas that isn't like bombastic that movie has never that kind of movie has never done well yeah you know like so that just you know it still made more than the original Blade Runner so because that, that it made, like, wouldn't be hard it wouldn't be hard yeah. so anyway uh, we will talk about all of that in uh, spoilery terms later but for now let's do a quick piece of housekeeping Sean all right uh, and that is that as you guys know we've had a patreon for a few months now which we launched around episode 200 and for various reasons, we're putting that Patreon on pause for the moment. Not sure if it's going to resume later on. Not sure if it'll go away entirely. But we haven't had a ton of people sign up. Uh, and we've had some time crunch on our end that has made it hard to produce some more content for the month of October. So we're putting it on pause. You won't, If you are a current Patreon, one, you're awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And two, uh, you won't be charged for the month of October. How Patreon does it is it charges you the first day of the following month. So if you were charged at the beginning of October, that was for all the September content. So that's how that all works. Um, and so it's on pause for now. Sean and I will be revisiting this on our own. One thing we can say is that uh, the future of like the Let's Play stuff is kind of in limbo just because it's extremely time consuming to create. Yeah. But the Doctor Who thing is not going away. That will be a monthly feature. Like this month's for October, we will be doing because it's really fun. And yeah. it'll be for the public this month. And, I mean, it was for the public after a week or two before. But that'll just be coming. I think we'll be recording that next week with next week's podcast. Because um, tonight there was just a little too much to record. Yeah. Uh, and it's not, not well, no. It's set October 15th. Fuck. The days are going by really fast. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, it is midway through the month. But we'll get it out by the end of October. And that, again, will be on the third Doctor story, The Demons. But, um, yeah. So we're just putting that on pause. And let us know, like, on Twitter... 
or uh, anywhere else like you contact us. Um, I think the Patreon page itself might have those options still. Just let us know if you have any thoughts on like, if you did sign up, what else would you like to see? If you didn't sign up, what were some of the reasons? Uh, any ideas you have for ways we could kind of refigure this in the future? You know, we might take another swing at it. We might not. The podcast isn't going anywhere. Yeah. We've got too much fun stuff to talk about. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's so much Doctor Who stuff in the future alone. Yeah, you know, we exactly. have to talk about yes. that. There's always more Doctor Who. There's always, There's always that, that classic Doctor Who well. No is one is deep and the, dark. Yes, it is. So, uh, speaking of that, Sean. Yeah. Transitioning away from housekeeping into stuff. My first piece of stuff for the evening is that I have continued my binge through the third Doctor run of Doctor Who. Yes. And I should say, I'm doing this back and forth with I'm watching that on my own, and then with my brother, we're going through the entire Stephen Moffat run. And we're in season six right now. We just watched Let's Kill Hitler earlier today. Okay, yeah. Um, which, the, boy, that season six is a glorious mess. Yeah, <laughs> All it's, it's, about it's real up and down, huh? It's real up and down. Like, in some ways, I'm, I know season seven is worse as an overall thing, it might have more episodes, I think, are like standout in it. I don't know. It's a weird. Well, if you're, era you're of the there's show. some good stuff in the back half of season six that you're coming up I, on. I like the first half of season six a lot. Yeah. The next one is we have the terrible Mark Gatiss episode, Night Terrors, which I have to somehow I, get through. I, that's not one of his worst ones. I, I not, I'm not going to say that Night Terrors is an amazing Doctor Who episode, but I think it is an acceptable. I one. have not seen it since the year 2011. Yeah. Maybe I'll like it more this time. Anyway, that's that run. It's fast. And I should say, here's a project I'm working on for you guys. Like a little preview. Is as I'm watching the Stephen Moffat run, I am ranking every Stephen Moffat written episode of Doctor Who. Jesus Christ. And that Christ. will be for our podcast because I thought that was a fun project. And I'm ranking them as I go, which makes it a lot easier than if I just took right. 50 episodes and tried to rank them. Yeah, they would be impossible for me yeah. to just sit down right now and like with a list no. of them and be like, I don't fucking know. How do you rank like Heaven Sit and Blink next to each other? Right. It's like that's like, kind of an impossible ask. Basically, I started with the four ones he did under Russell T. Davies. And I should say not just episodes, but stories. So if it's a right. two-parter, yeah, they're yeah, together. Yeah. And I I ranked those four, which I've always kind of had the rank in my head, and that's easy. And then I'm like ranking everything else around those, and it's a lot of fun. But it is interesting how it goes in like waves. Like all of his season of six episodes are near the bottom of the list for me, and I like some of them. Like Good Man Goes to War and Let's Kill Hitler are really good episodes. Yeah, like that's the beginning of the part of the list where like I really like these, and we haven't gotten to any really that I hate or anything. That's season seven. <laughs> Right. But, you know, like, we'll see. Is is Wedding of River Song or Name of the Doctor the worst Stephen Moffat episode? Yeah. I'm going to find out. And this will, we will be doing a big Stephen Moffat podcast. I don't know if that will be, like, just before Christmas or just after. But we're going to do the big retrospective, and yeah. I will have that list for you guys. But it's it's taking work, so I'm starting early. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to hear your thoughts on Season 6 after you finish rewatching it. Because you haven't rewatched it since it aired, right? I've rewatched parts of it. I've right, seen... but you haven't, like, watched, like, the thing in succession since No, I have not. Yeah. I have seen season six part one two or three times like back when it was airing. But yeah, like the whole thing, like Doctor's Wife I've seen like ten times. Right, yeah. You know, uh, even Wedding of River Song I think I went back to at some point just because it's like, what is this episode? Uh -huh. And it's like, a, it's like a puzzle, not like the story, but like how, why, yeah, how, like, what? Yes. <laughs> like the floundering that is going on in that episode of like Jesus also, Christ. Also, I, I have to say, the Doctor Who puns started way earlier than I remembered. Uh-huh. Like, there's the season six premiere to the season seven finale. It's all Doctor Who puns all the way. I mean, the problem is that we didn't do, like, continuous Doctor Who podcast episodes for season six. We only did a couple of them. We so did, you yeah. didn't get me just bitching about them every single episode back then? It's because... Cause it's 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 fascinating to... Tra we'll talk about this a lot when we get to the Stephen Moffat retrospective podcast. It is fascinating to me to trace his arc as the showrunner of Doctor Who... Because some of his strengths are always there, some come into focus later, some things he's weak on, which I would include some issues with writing women, he gets much, much, much better at. Like, yeah. once you have, like, Clara on board and things like that, until you get to Bill, who is a, a just a phenomenal female character, and complex and all these things. And I just, it's a really fascinating journey, because, it, yeah, I, I've seen season five several times, but season six and seven, there's a lot of episodes I've only seen once. So going back and seeing these last seven or eight years of Doctor Who history is fascinating. Yeah. But going even further back. Uh-huh. Sean? Yeah. I am, uh, I, let's see, third Doctor, I've seen all of his first season. Yeah, and I've seen the season. I've seen most of his second season, which all is the master season. season. Yeah. And uh, the next one I have to watch is Colony in Space, and then it's The Demons. It's a good one. Uh, but I just finished Claws of Axis. 
And I've always wanted to go back and rewatch Claws of Access because I haven't seen it since the day. It's the weakest third Doctor story so far, but it also has a final episode where the Master and the Doctor team up and like try to right. escape Earth together, and it's fucking amazing. Yeah. The, I mean, I don't even know where to start, Sean. The third, we'll talk about this on the bonus pod, but the third Doctor's run is so amazing. Like, mm-hmm. his first season is, like, one of the best seasons of Doctor Who. Like, it's just... You have Inferno, you have Doctor Who and the Silurians, you have Spearhead from Space. All of those are A-plus all-time classics. Yeah. And then you have The Ambassadors of Death, which I will vouch for as a flawed but good story. And that's just an amazing season. And that's before you even get Joe Grant. Right, yeah. And The Master. Yeah. And both of those are season seven. And I have to say, the Autons are the best character, the best villains for introducing characters. Uh-huh. Because Spearhead from Space, you get Third Doctor and the entire unit structure of the new series. And Liz Grant. Yeah. Or Liz, or Liz Shaw. Shaw, sorry. Yes, you just remember it's the same name as the main character from Prometheus. Yes. Which, if you ever unfortunately rewatch Prometheus, you will now understand why I found that extraordinarily confusing the, when I watched that movie the first time. Uh, I'd be way better with the real Liz Shaw. Exactly. I mean, she's be. an actual scientist. She Liz is. Shaw. Yes. Um, maybe too much of one, and that's why they had to get rid of her. Exactly. I don't know. Yeah. But like, if that, and then uh, Terror of the Autons, you get the Master and. Uh, Joe Grant yep. and then Rose the first episode of the modern series introduced the whole modern series the Autons are like they bat a thousand exactly I mean they've only been used you've just named all yes. the times they've been used but they were all great They're, and it's not an Auton story but they are in Pandorica Opens the Big Bang which is a great Stephen Moffat story that is also true so the Autons really do bat a thousand uh, and fucking Third Doctor so far for me bats a thousand yeah he's amazing Joe Grant's amazing. Mm-hmm. The Brigadier is the fucking best. Yeah. And Roger Delgado's Master, Sean. Yes, now you, you talked you about finally him. know. You finally know what I've been talking about for fucking like 10 years now. Did you see the video I tweeted? Yes. Yes. With like, I, I watched that clip like 10 times in a row. Uh-huh. If you didn't see what I tweeted, it's, it's I think it's part three of Terror of the Autons. Uh, yeah. Is the Master calls the Doctor and uses this like little weird device to make the plastic on the phone wire like strangle the Doctor. And Roger Delgado just gets this little shitty eating grin, and it's one of the greatest moments in TV history. Yeah. Roger Delgado and John Pertwee have explosive chemistry. Yes. Have you... I don't remember if this is in um, the second John Pertwee season or not, but I think it's the Sea Devils. Have you watched that one yet? That's a later uh, season. The, when you get to that one, there's a good... There's a sword fight scene okay. in that one between the Master and the Doctor that is so fucking good. Yeah, because I've been... I mean, it's one of the things about the third and fourth Doctor runs is when you look down the list of titles, it's just like hit, 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 yeah. hit. It's all like episodes that you have probably heard people talking about. Like, yeah. oh yeah, I've heard someone mention this sometime. And like the third Doctor, because I've seen some of his later stuff, it's strong all the way through. Yeah, like, I'm sure there's some lesser serials, but like, there's no point where like, I don't know any of the serials this season it's like you know his last season starts with the time warrior exactly yeah i mean fucking hell i i am having so much fun with this sean and uh, i just can't wait to keep going and yeah just an entire season of him and the master going back and forth and it's it's also brought something into stark relief for me about how you characterize the master on doctor who which is the way roger delgado plays him and the way terence dix and company wrote him that season the Master is kind of a shitty villain. He's uh-huh. constantly getting in over his head and fucking everything up, and the Doctor has to come clean it He's up. He's the evil version of the Doctor, because the Doctor also <laughs> is constantly getting in over his head and fucking things up. Yes, and it's just, it's a what, like, every Master story is he aligns with some race he thinks he can control, uh-huh. he very much can't, and then the Doctor has to help him figure it all out. And actually, like, to be fair... That was very faithfully done in the uh, in the the John Sim stories, sure, yeah, and to a lesser extent the Michelle Gomez stories, which I think are a different kind of thing. Of it, like her first one is a very like traditional master story, and then it goes in a different direction yeah. with her. But like, I just I love that about the master and uh, Roger Delgado, man, he is awesome, so good. Just like and and was, his his just his look is so perfect. The fucking beard, the like the full black he's, suit. He is one of the best cinematic representations of Moriarty, and he's not Moriarty. Exactly, yeah. But, like, yeah, he's up there. He's so good. Just, I mean, honestly, like, if you've never dived into classic Doctor Who, the th- and you want to see some of it, like, in context, the third Doctor run is super easy to get into. Yeah. Because it, it, it's not like it has, like, super high continuity. Like, each story is, like, t- tied inexorably to the last one. But it has a regular cast of, like, four yeah. or five or six people. And it carries along. And it feels more like kind of a regular television show than a lot of years of Doctor Who. Because it also, since so many of the stories, particularly in the early sections that you're in, are set just on Earth. Yep. Like, that, I think, allows them to do some things that when you have to, like, create an alien planet, 
or like space station every single episode makes it a little bit harder right then it does have more of that feeling of like oh yeah we've got like this more normal supporting cast i just kind of like more normal structures in the show that you get kind of comfortable and used to that's something that's not really common to doctor who the third doctor era really cemented a type of storytelling i've always loved in doctor who but i didn't know it kind of comes from here which is people human beings are messing with science they don't understand uh-huh. and the doctor has to come clean up their mess and that's like every third doctor story yeah and i love it and i'm actually excited for colony in space because i know he actually goes to space this time yeah so it's gonna be cool anyway i just had to gush about that because i can't wait until next week but we will talk a lot more about the third doctor next yes, week. yes we will i i have not rewatched the demons yet so i have to okay. get around to that i'm really i mean half of the reason why i picked the demons was just because i i've had just never for whatever reason gone back to it since i first watched it okay you know my memory it's so good and i've always like in the like everyone talks about how good it is and like i just really want to fucking rewatch the story and i, and I need am, an excuse to i am sure it is i can't wait to watch it i don't doubt your judgment i will say when i finished watching inferno uh-huh. almost all in one se- sitting even though it's seven fucking episodes i was like why didn't sean pick this one because it doesn't have the master in it, it was, then, the, no, was one of the main reasons totally fair but you should watch Inferno. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, you should watch that whole first season of The Third Doctors because it oh, is so it's good. really, really strong. And, and yeah, it's The Third Doctor era is fascinating and, and so unique. And I'm ex- I really do want to... I probably will have to take a break and jump forward when we do a Fourth Doctor story. But I want to watch straight through all the Fourth Doctor stuff, too. Because, yeah. like, that's another... Like, those two eras are the ones that... I mean, one, they're all available. And two, they're so praised. That's like, yeah, you know, and they don't have, I know, like the, the notorious gaps of the fifth, sixth, and seventh doctors. Yeah, they're they're really consistent in quality. Like, yeah. and that's the one of those things that you don't get that consistency in quality until the last two seventh doctor seasons. Which is why I think myself and a lot of people hold the seventh doctor like in really high regard because it's like it was this last shining moment for classic doctors. Like, oh shit, it's like all four of these stories in a row were really good. That hasn't been true since like the mid seventies. I mean, it's just rare. Like, honestly, I did... Like, the third Doctor run is obviously nothing like the 12th Doctor run. But it was making me think, like, the 12th Doctor run has been so qualitatively consistent. Yeah. It's like... The, and, and watching, like, the 11th Doctor run... I love the 11th Doctor... But it's a it's it's kind of a standard Doctor Who run, and then it's got ups and downs. Yeah, you know. So anyway, uh, too much Doctor Who talk. Let's move on. Um, There's never too much Doctor Who pod talk on this podcast. Not I, while I'm here. I've got a few video game thoughts, but I've been talking for a while, Sean. What have you been up to? Um, I've been up to a couple of things. One that I'm not going to talk about this a lot because we have a lot to talk about on the podcast, but just want to bring it up, and I'll talk about it more in depth next week. Is I have finally started playing Neo. Oh, it's good. N I O H Neo, not like the Matrix Neo. <laughs> it's, just like, it's very hard to talk about this game to people because obviously you're not thinking in Japanese when you hear someone say Neo. Um, but for people who don't remember, that's the sort of like the pithy way to describe it is Samurai Dark Souls. That's like, it's so much more than that, but that's like the basics of, you know, kind of get the image of what the game is in your head. This is a back of the box pitch. Exactly. And, and it's, I played through the alpha like a year ago, basically, and then the beta that they did a little bit after that. And so like, this is a game I've been following for a while and I just had never had the time. And then this, like, two weeks or whatever, two to three weeks of, like, leading up to Wolfenstein coming out, like, I'm not going to probably be able to finish Neo, but I need to put a big dent into it because it's a game I want to finish before the end of this year so we, I can talk about it on the, pod, in, in the year podcast and put it in my Game of the Year list. And it's really fucking good. I mean, I already knew it was really good from playing the Alpha and Beta, but, yeah, it's a it's a fantastic game. But in game. context, like, as a game. It's... Yeah, and, like, being able to engage with, like, the larger sort of, like, loot systems. And there's, like, a lot of really complex systems in the game that, that take a little bit to get your head around. But it's the thing of... I, I'm realizing more and more the older I'm getting that I'm getting more and more into these games that have, like, really intricate systems and, like, like bigger systems. It's one of the things I like about Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth is, like, looking at this thing and being, like you know at your first pass this is the most insane daunting like checklist of things and just like grid i'm staring at this like i have no idea what i'm looking at but now i have this like more adult sensibility of like i can kind of see a little bit on the other side of just how satisfying it will be when i'm like i have mastered all of this i can when i look at this grid in this chart i like intuitively know where everything's going and like how to manipulate these systems to my advantage and Neo definitely has a lot of that stuff with how you can reforge weapons and do craft shit and do all this crazy shit. Um, yeah, it's it's a really awesome game, and I'll talk about it more next week. Because honestly, I'm not that far past where you where I got in the alpha and beta. Obviously, like those levels have been refined, but across those two sort of like you know pre-release access things, 
I played most of what is available in sort of the first area of the game because they've had different levels open in both of them. So now I'm I, I, next week I'll talk about more of that in detail. It's really awesome. But the thing I did play more of and that I have a lot to talk about because I found it a very interesting experience is we get to take a trip back down to to my, my video game Beta Corner. Sean's Beta Corner! Yes, thank you very much. Welcome welcome to Sean's Beta Corner. At we... some point we'll get a real theme yeah. song by episode 300. <laughs> yes, welcome to Sean's Beta Corner where we talk about the latest and greatest and the hottest releases of video game betas. Um, this week on the show, uh, I played the beta of Star Wars Battlefront 2, which was available, I think, last week. Because I would... If I had had time, we would have been able to talk about it on last They publicized that like shit. I have not heard of this. Yeah. That it was even a beta. Maybe it got swallowed by like the Last Jedi trailer. I don't know. But... Probably. Just like, and it, it did kind of get a quiet release. And I think the the sort of the, to, to use the parlance of our times, the hype level around Star Wars Battlefront 2 has not been super high, I feel like. But because I also, I don't even, I just think I kind of like saw it in like a tweet from someone I follow that's like, oh, I'm playing the Star Wars Battlefront 2 beta. It's like... Oh, that's a thing, I guess. I'll download that because that's how, that's the only way I played Star Wars Battlefront 1 for people who listened to the podcast two years ago. I played it there and I was like, well, th- I had fun playing this and I could very much tell I do not need to buy the whole game. I had all the fun I need with Star Wars Battlefront by playing like two to three hours of the Hoth level I, in the beta. And I felt th- that that proved true. I didn't do the beta, but I did the EA access like 10 free hours and I. It's like I don't need to pay for more. That yeah, was fine. It's like it's it's it was. I found Star Wars Battlefront One to wrap up my experience of that beta to give context for the Battlefront Two beta is one. I I'm a big fan of the old school Battlefront games, and these Battlefront games are nothing like them basically at all. So you kind of have to put that out of your mind. But the last Battlefront beta that basically you could just play the Hoth level, and that was kind of all that was available was that thing of like, man, this game looks amazing. The sound design is incredible. This is Star Wars as fuck. And I'm a big Star Wars fan. And, but it's like a really incredibly shallow first person shooter. And so, you know, play that mode for two to three hours. And it's like, I, I I was glad that I played it because it, because of how spectacular it was, but very glad that I didn't pay money for it. Because it was like the kind of thing that's, I'm not going to come back to this. This game has like five modes and like seven maps or something. And it's like multiplayer only. And like it's fun in like this brief spurt. But it was very much a thing that felt like it would never have had legs to me. And I feel like that mostly proved true in the full release. The Battlefront 2 beta, there's a little bit more open to you. Although it's mostly like there's only really one mode that you kind of want to play. And that's the... um. It's the mode they showed at E3 this year where you're on um, Thebe, you know, the big city on Naboo. So it is uh, clone troopers versus droids, even though technically speaking, the clone troopers would not have been around for the Battle of Thebe, Naboo, if you remember, if you watched Star Wars Episode One, So that's like one mark against it already. You're already losing. Um, no, obviously I don't give a shit about that. <laughs> but so you're playing on Thebe and it's a fairly similar game type to the Battlefront 1 Hoth thing of there's like, this big tank thing sort of like slowly moving towards the Thee Palace that the droids are trying to defend and the the clones are trying to attack it. And then if it gets over to the palace, it blows up the doors to the palace and that moves to a sort of second phase of the multiplayer map where you you have to, the clones have to sort of defend these two kind of like switches or something that gain access to the throne room and the droids are trying to get those and the tro- droids get those and moves to the final phase where you are in the throne room and there it's basically like a king of the hill match where the droids just have to kind of like get into this zone around the throne and stay there for a certain amount of time. Um, or the, the clones can, if they can, if the clones can kill enough droids, they will run out of lives and then that's how the clones win. And so it's kind of this three stage um, level. The other stuff was available is there was like two trial thingies um, that you could play that are basically single player missions. Um, one of which was kind of cool because it just let you play as Darth Maul and playing as Darth Maul is reasonably fun. But they were just like, kill a bunch of guys in this time limit and there wasn't a lot there. And then there was another mode that I found really bad that was set on the um, one planet, the sort of like the grassy tree planet from episode seven where the one Yoda-esque lady is. The fucking what's the name of that? Maz, Maz, is that it? Oh, Maz Kanata from yes, Seven. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, from yeah. Episode Seven. Yeah. So you're on that map, and it was basically like a capture the flag mode, and I found that really bad, um, just because like the map design did not feel like it was designed for capture the flag. So I kind of like tested those other things and didn't find them very good, and and then there was a Starfighter thing, and well, I'll come back to the Starfighter thing because that was fucking insane. 
Um, not good insane. Just insane insane. Part of, partially because of a glitch. Partially because of, they don't know how to fucking design controls. Um, but the main, the core thing of the beta is that feed map. And I guess I don't know even where to start with this. One... I found I don't know if it's just that this isn't 2015 anymore and it's a lot harder to impress with graphics on these consoles or not, or if it's just that Battlefront 2 simply does not look as good as Battlefront 1 because it really did not feel like I was not getting that sense of like, oh, look how amazing this looks. It's like, look how stark and barren the streets of Theed are. The map is really poorly designed, that it's really blocky. There's these really like tight, strict lanes that you move into. There's basically these three sets of lanes, and that's it. There's no like dynamic movement. There's no interplay. There's no like good sense of cover or flow of the map at all. It's just basically you're either in the right lane, the big middle lane, or the left lane, and that's the only kind of area in the map you get to move in until you move to the smaller sort of like corridor shooting stuff, which is also not designed particularly well. And there are a bunch of weird graphical glitches of they had this very John Woo-esque doves that would fly out of the ground all over the place. But it was really, but it did it constantly to the point of absolute absurdity, which is also like not a Star Wars thing at all. No. So there's just doves flying out of the ground. That was the other thing is that it wasn't like there were these doves with like an idle animation on the ground that when you ran towards them, they flew away. It was just, you were running and then doves just like materialized through the bottom of the street and just flew into the air. It's like, this looks bad like this just looks unfinished unpolished and and very much not like what like the thing that the old like Star Wars Battlefront dice game from 2015 had which was like it looked polished up the ass like it was so nice looking they had this like really nice veneer it just felt like everything had like this triple pass over it to make it look great to make it like you know everything had the right level of sheen on it that felt really professional that in a way that even if I didn't care that much for the gameplay I had to like begrudgingly respect what the the work that DICE does with that sort of like the visual polish and that stuff because there's some of the best in the biz at that and Battlefront 2 I didn't get that sensation at all um the sound design is also not great it's it's like Star Wars it's like really kind of bread and butter Star Wars sound effects but there's not the extra level of oomph that I felt Star Wars Battlefront 1 had like this extra level of like it wasn't just the Star Wars sound effects you know it was like the Star Wars sound effects you know pushed to a like much higher level of fidelity which a much like which a, with, a, with a greater dynamic range of sound to it that felt like it made great use of you know like bass and stuff like that that the like classic Star Wars sound effects if you just pull those original sound effects from the movies don't necessarily have it felt like in Star Wars Battlefront 1 they did a good job of interpreting those sound effects and making them just like fucking awesome sounding. And this, it just sounds like the most generic Star Wars video game you could possibly pull. And so that immediately, extremely disappointing. That that it doesn't even do the thing that was the good thing about I mean, Star Wars Battlefront 1 for like the Star Wars Battlefront 2015, I'll call it. Battlefront 2015 underperformed, we can say, right? Like, yes, yeah. It, it was the kind of game that was like, you could buy it for like $9 three months after launch. You can buy it for like $3 at any given moment. That game is constantly on sale yes. to an absurd degree. You know, I think it had its moment of hype. I also think it showed that like part of why we're not in a moment where movies get video game releases is because that hype doesn't work both ways anymore. Sure. And I just, part of that, I, I hear all that, it's like, Maybe it just got a budget cut. Like, because Battlefront 1 was probably sure. an insanely expensive game. And maybe it's like, it'll probably sell what it's going to sell, whether we put the money into it or not. So, yeah. fuck it. I mean, there is also, they have, like, there is more in this one. That is yeah, actually, yeah. that's one of the things I can say is that even though there is more available in the, there was more available in the Star Wars Battlefront 2 beta than there was in the Battlefront 1 beta by, like, quite a bit, actually. I didn't get the sensation playing this beta that, like, I have seen everything this game has to offer, basically, in the uh -huh. way I did with Battlefront 1 beta. Because, I mean, this Battlefront 2 is going to have a full single-player mode. It has all these, like, weird time trial challenge things that feel more designed than the sort of, like, pseudo half-hearted single-player stuff was in the first Battlefront. There are just more multiplayer modes. They have the Starfighter stuff that I'll talk about. It, like, and it has, you know, it has the clone troopers and the droid stuff. And it also has, like, the the sort of original trilogy stuff and then it also has you know like you could i never actually managed to do it because i'll talk about the point system but you can play as ray from the new movie so it does have not just like the new movie locations but it does have some of the new movie characters in it 
Um, so it has that sort of breadth of content that very much felt lacking from the original Star from from Battlefront 2015. Um, it just might not have the depth. But yeah, it still definitely does not have the depth. So the the gunplay is still really bad. They did make it so it's class based this time, which the 2015 Battlefront was not. Like it was just. I mean, one of my big complaints with the 2015 Battlefront game was that every single gun felt literally exactly the same. And I was hoping that going to the class-based system that the old, old Battlefront games used was like, that's like guarantee now these, ha like the guns have to feel different because now like I'm picking a sniper dude or I'm picking like the engineer dude who has shotgun or, you know, like I'm picking the assault dude who has, you know, an assault rifle. They, the, all these classes have to feel different because that is like basically the definition like it's like that's the lowest bar a class-based shooter has to hit is the classes feel different and unique and unfortunately the classes do not feel different and unique in battlefront 2 um it feels like they basically they took the like kind of vaguely four different gun types that existed in 2015 battlefront which were not particularly well differentiated and just gave them to four different classes so you have the assault rifle class which has the assault rifle you have a heavy class which has a like basically slightly heavier assault rifle that is a little less accurate you have the officer class who has a pistol that is a, basically a semi-automatic weapon but has more or less the same range of engagement that the assault rifle does and then you have the sniper I, they call it specialist they don't call it sniper because the zoom on the sniper is basically like the zoom on the pistol in Halo 1, it's like, it's like a little tiny, like you get a little bit more in there, but not much. And it's, you know, a pretty quick semi-automatic weapon. And so the range of engagement on all the weapons is basically the exact same. They all function at like this kind of like mid-range level of efficacy with like a little bit of good close range stuff. But there's no, like, there's no real shotgun there's no real sniper rifle. You have these abilities that are kind of like, from what I remember 2015 Battlefront having, that you have these class abilities that you can get that sort of will give you like, oh, this is kind of a shotgun. Like you have grenades that recharge almost kind of like Destiny. And so you have some of those options that differentiate the classes a little bit, but it still doesn't give you that kind of like diverse range of sort of options that you expect, especially from a class-based shooter, but even a normal first-person shooter. Like in Call of Duty, as much as you can make fun of in like a modern Call of Duty game that like every gun is an assault rifle, when you actually look at it, that's not the case. Like they have shotguns, they have sniper rifles that are like sniper rifle, sniper rifles. And there's a reasonable level of differentiation within like submachine guns and assault rifles in a modern first-person shooter that even if it's not as extreme as the difference between like every gun in Halo 1 was, there is still this like distinct level of differentiation that you can identify with each gun. And Battlefront 2, it just feels like, nope, like there's no reload mechanic still. It's like still this sort of weird overheat thing that they add a bit of an active reload thing to. Every gun is, feels basically the same level of accurate. Every gun feels like it kind of does the same amount of damage and every gun feels like it's useful in the basically the same range of engagement as every other gun. It's like, and you also can't carry, so, you only have one gun. You Like, each, each class only has the one gun. You don't even have, like, another, like, a secondary you can switch to. So, these aren't classes. These are loadouts. Basically, yes. Yeah. They're, like, it, it does, it, that's kind of what it feels like. It feels like you just get to spawn in with, like, the default Call of Duty loadouts that you get before you can unlock your create a class thing. Right. You're like, oh, none of these feel that good, and they're kind of weird and bad. Like, I just want to make my own thing. Um, which you can customize the classes a little bit in Star Wars Battlefront 2 um, with the system called Star Cards, which if there are, if people have heard anything about Battlefront 2, they have probably heard about how, um, like a number of different games this fall, and for like the past couple of years, I think Halo 5 was one of the first $60 games that did this, uh, Battlefront 2 has loot boxes as microtransaction payments, which is basically what they're doing in lieu of having a normal sort of progression mechanic that you would expect you know, from like this, like post Call of Duty 4 era of multiplayer shooters, instead of just having that kind of like normal, well-designed progression mechanic, instead you have to, either you can pay money, which obviously in the beta you couldn't because it was a beta, but for the full game, you'll be able to pay money to get these like booster packs or loot boxes of abilities that you, that will give you a random set of abilities that you can slot in that will modify bits of the classes that will be like, oh, instead of this like, you know thermal detonator grenade it'll be a like emp grenade or that kind of like it does that kind of stuff or it'll be like oh the the shoulder charge that han solo uses will like go a little bit further or something like that and each class has i think six different slots that star cards can go into 
Um, so you can either pay money for them or you would, or you, and I did over the course of playing the beta for a couple of matches, earn enough like in-game credits to just be able to buy them on my own. And that was what, and then buying them on my own made me realize, oh, wait, this is a terrible fucking progression mechanic. Like regardless of how gross and exploitative and predatory it feels to have that kind of like loot box mechanic, especially in a $60 game. I don't like that mechanic, even if it's a free to play game, but if it's $60, like it just feels especially gross. Um, but regardless of like the, even if there wasn't that option to pay real money for it, it's just a shitty fucking way to yeah. design your progression mechanic because there's no, I can't, if I'm deciding like, oh, I want to, you know, I really like playing Darth Maul in Star Wars Battlefront 2, which is true. I had a lot of fun playing as Darth Maul the one time I managed to get it to go in in like an actual multiplayer match. It was like, this is a fun way to play this game. I want to unlock more abilities that makes Darth Maul cooler. Well, unfortunately, of like the three loot boxes I got, I didn't get any Darth Maul abilities at all. I got a couple of Han Solo ones, which I never played as Han Solo because it's hard to be able to play as a hero in the first place. And I'm not going to play as a hero that just shoots another gun. I played this whole game shooting a, playing a guy who shoots a fucking gun. I want to be one of the people that just doesn't shoot a gun. I want to be a lightsaber person. So by, I got a bunch of Han Solo stuff and then I got a bunch of upgrades for the like officer class that I almost never this, used. This is the one thing I heard about Battlefront 2. And I, you know, I think, look, all loot box mechanics, if they're, if they have a microtransaction system are predatory and bad. Yeah. All of them. But, you know, at least with something like Overwatch, it's just purely cosmetic and it's not like part of the progression system. And so, like, you know, I think most people would not necessarily feel like that they have to get all the... They have to pay for Overwatch loot boxes to win the game, right? Sure. But, like, you could... If you got into Battlefront 2, you could very easily fall down the rabbit hole of, fuck, I'm not getting my Darth Maul drops. Well, it will only cost five bucks to get more packs. And then you start falling down the yeah. path. And it's also just bad gameplay. Yeah, it's also just, like, it, it sucks because it doesn't feel like it's designed in the way that, like... You know, that as tired in some ways as like the Call of Duty multiplayer model has become, it still is satisfying to be like, okay, I really like using this submachine gun. And, and if I get three double kills with it, I get the rapid fire mod. And like, that's how you unlock that. It's not just like, oh, I like play the game enough and just like, you know, throw enough dice at the fucking wall that eventually it comes up like a cog scope on the gun I like to use. It's like, no, I, get, I use this gun and through like completing a set of challenges or whatever it is, I unlock the stuff that I want on this gun. To level playing better. field, right? Exactly. It's a level playing field that also just gives that sense of like, if of just like designed progression. It's even something that it doesn't even have to be like multiplayer. That's when I replayed Wolfenstein The New Order earlier this year. That game has, or like Doom also has this, the new Doom. Of that, you know, there are specific challenges and stuff that if you complete, it's, oh, like, this makes it so that I can carry more ammo with the assault rifle if I do these things in the game. Like, that's interesting gameplay that gets me to experiment with different things and, like, the full, like, range of abilities that are on offer to me in a way that when games didn't do that, it was very easy to sort of pigeonhole yourself and, like, oh, I'm just going to use this one gun this one way. But then when you see, like, oh, well, you know, if I try to go for headshots more or if, like, oh, if I use this grenade, maybe I'll unlock something that's else that is useful, that forces you to play the game in different ways. And so, like, those progression systems are not just, like, a, a you know, it's not just sort of, like, bait on a hook or whatever to get you to keep on playing Call of Duty forever and ever and ever. It does serve a bit of that purpose as well. But those progression systems have also been designed to be interesting bits of gameplay and incentive. And if you're just doing this fucking loot box model, it doesn't have that at all. Like, it's just like, like I said, it's just throwing dice at the wall, hoping it comes up Darth Maul eventually. And for me playing the beta, it just never did. And so I kept on getting all these fucking Han Solo mods. It's like, I don't really want to, I don't want to play as Han Solo that much. And even if I did want to play as Han Solo, you have to, the way that works is it's basically like a, on like, not quite like a kill spree because the points like maintain across deaths. But you do have to like stack up a decent number of points by performing well in the game to be able to get a hero. And and which is, you know, might be kind of a fine system on its own. The problem with like that mechanic was that you could only have one of each hero type on the battlefield at once. And so basically the, the good guys had two heroes, Han Solo and Rey, and the bad guys had two heroes, Boba Fett and Darth Maul. And so you could only have one Rey, one Han Solo, one Boba Fett, and one Darth Maul on the map at a time. And once you got to the end of the game, 
the, basically every player has enough points at the very end if the match has gone on to the third phase to buy a hero. So now everyone's just playing as the heroes and you can't get in. So it's like, that was the thing of like, I had played as Darth Maul once and it was like, because I did well enough early on in the match to be able to play as him like halfway through. And it's like, oh, that's really fun. Playing as Darth Maul is really cool. I actually think that's like, that's one of the few areas that this Battlefront 2 feels superior to the old Battlefront 2 is that playing as the hero was more, playing as like a, a Jedi character was more fun to me. So it's like, oh, now I want to play as Rey. And so I kept on like, one, you can't pick which side you're going to be on, which is fine. You know, that makes sense. But the one, but I did get to be a clone trooper. It's like, okay, finally, I want to play as Rey. I want to see like what her abilities are and all this stuff. And I, and I think one time what happened was the clone, like my team just like stomped the enemy team. And so we ended it at the first phase. And it was the only time I'd seen that happen. It was like, well, shit, like obviously nobody gets to play as a hero when this game ended in three minutes. And then it's like played like three more matches or something until it came up clone troopers again. And then that time it did, I did manage to get like all the way to the third round. It was like, okay, I now have enough points at the top of the third round to play as Ray, but uh Oh, someone else is playing as Ray. Can't play as Ray. Can't even play as hot. I couldn't even pick. Wait, 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 wait. I just have a question. This is not related to like the game's quality. Okay. But it is a thing that's bothering me because I'm yeah. having trouble tracking it. Yes. So the stormtroopers are the good guys because it's on a prequel map. And well, the clone the, troopers. Clone troopers. Yes. But it's Ray and Han Solo, and by their time, clone troopers are the bad guys. Yes. Yeah, so the the yes, it did. If you're going that to, messes me up a little. If you're bit. going to squibble about like the details of the timeline stuff, yes, like they do not restrict um, okay. the heroes to the appropriate timelines, which was something that Battlefront Two, the old Battlefront Two, did was that if you played on the Naboo map, you know the clone expect, troopers like, were Obi Wan and, and Obi Wan or something. Yeah, on there's. That. I don't even know if there's a young Obi Wan Kenobi. I would be. It would be tragic if there isn't. And is there Han, should be. Is Han Solo young or old? It's just like normal. I mean, I say it's normal Harrison Ford. Their Harrison Ford has like a specific quality to him that's just like, it's just off enough. It's that Uncanny Valley thing of like, this is closer to Harrison Ford than I think I maybe have ever seen a video game character model be because he's not in that many video games anymore. But it's still far enough away now that it's like, this is really creeping me out. Like I would much rather have like Jedi Knight 2 like Han Solo from the like early 2000s than this like, yeah, like, like, close to this, like, do you guys actually not have the rights to the likeness or something? Because he's just off enough that it's like, that's like, it's like you have Harrison Ford and then you push, like, the generic slider, like, generic white dude slider, like, a bit, a little bit more to the middle. It's like, no, like, Harrison Ford just looks more distinctive than this. It's weird. That's weird. Do they do, like, the chin scar or anything? Um, I couldn't. See, okay. they did, I couldn't zoom in on the character model enough to see. I, I would actually did kind of try to check that. Yeah, because that's like the way you can tell. Yeah, because that's that has survived through all incarnations of Harrison yes, Ford. Exactly. That's if you're making a CG Harrison Ford. That's the first detail you need to get because whether people know about that scar or not, you have subconsciously registered yes. it. It's... Um, but yeah. So, but anyway. Okay. So, so Battlefront Two is shallow. Yes, it's very shallow. Surprise. I wanted to play as Ray. Couldn't play as Ray until like, and then finally, the one person who was playing as Ray. Died and I was like, okay, now's my chance. I died on purpose because you have to, you know, be respawning to be able to pick the hero character. And I picked Ray and w and spawned in as Ray, literally at the precise moment that my team killed the last enemy droid to like deplete all their lives. And so I spawned in as Ray and like was about to move forward, and the game was over. And so I got to st stare at her standing there in here. What I think is the actual Daisy Ridley like deliver a quote from from Episode Seven. I'm pretty sure it's actually her. Like, their Harrison Ford impersonation is not quite there. Kind of like with their model. Yeah. But it sounded like actual Daisy Ridley. I was like, well, you know, at least they got her to do the voice line was the most I could get out of. Well, they got John Boyega, right? Yes. They, yes. So I, they probably got Daisy Ridley. Yeah. So Daisy Ridley, who, by the way, saw an interview with her on YouTube this week, like, that came up with the Star Wars trailer. Her actual voice, like, when she's not altering it for Star Wars... She sounds so much like Kira Knightley uh -huh. that it's eerie. Like I close my eyes and I just see Kira Knightley, and it's like you're not Kira Knightley. This freaks me out. You two should do a movie together where no one knows who's talking. Maybe, maybe that's the secret about Ray's heritage in in so the Kira Knightley because Kira Knightley was, was in, in episode one as as Padme's like body double. 
Boy, that would be a deep cut. That would she's be like the deepest Padme's cut. double cut, du- body doubles granddaughter or something. Yeah, it's just like and that's her like weird connection to the Force somehow. I don't know, but maybe that's where they're going with it. Who knows? Yeah, Kira Knightley signed up to re- like reprise her role as because I was going to be my... body double from Episode One, The Phantom Menace. Yeah, like they must be from the exact same area in England or something because it's the same yeah. accent. Sorry, I'm getting off track. Yes. But Blade Runner or uh, Battlefront Two is, you know, as we've said, not the most interesting yeah. game. So yeah. Last thing to say about Battlefront Two is the Starfighter stuff. So okay. this is the stuff I was I was pretty excited for because in the the old lineage of Battlefront games, that was one of the big additions to the old Battlefront Two was they added in space combat and you could like. It was really fucking awesome because you could get onto a ship in like one of your like a like a tie fighter or something in a capital like ship a star destroyer and fly around and you could either destroy enemy fighters and and your goal was to take down the enemy capital ship but you could also go and land inside their ship and try to destroy their ship from the inside and destroy some of their like important systems in there it, it was a little bit clumsy and repetitive but it was a really cool idea that I've never seen any other game do so it's like okay let's see what the new battlefront 2 does one it doesn't do it doesn't do any of that stuff so it doesn't have like the capital ship like destroy like fly inside land and then play as a trooper kind of thing which i didn't think they were going to do but there was a still part of it that was like oh that seems like you should have done that because that's fucking awesome um but it is basically you're just flying uh, in in the one level they had available it was like tie fighters next wings um, and so I spawned in as an imperial person and as a tie fighter and i was really excited that i had done something so i had already seen uh, watched a little bit of a video before while i was like downloading the battlefront 2 beta just see what was in the beta and in that video i noticed that like they were talking about the the controls for the starfighters and how weird it was um and basically how it's set up if i can remember correctly it was like fucking what was it it was like on the left stick i think it was forward and back is boost and left and right was like your roll or something what i I was trying to like it was something where because you have you know in starship controls you have your or like any airplane controls you have your pitch which is you going like up and down you have your yaw which is you going left and right and you have your roll which is you rolling around the 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 z-axis right and so it's something that what you ideally what you want is you want your um your pitch and your yaw to be on the left stick and you want your boost and your roll to be on the right stick. That's how the old Battlefront 2 had it. You can set up your controls to be that way in the new Battlefront 2, but how it is by default is that the the pitch and the yaw are separated on sticks. I don't remember which one's which, but it's like the pitch is like on the left stick and the yaw is on the right stick. So basically, if you wanted to go up into the right, you'd have to pull back on the left stick and push right on the right stick to go up into the right. And instead of just pushing back into the right or back into the left depending on how you're inverting your axes on one of the sticks which is how any insane or any sane game would do it is that one stick controls your fucking pitch and your yaw that's how literally like every video game ever has done that it's like star fox back you know to yeah. that star like fox default. anything yeah. i mean if you because you basically you want to have one stick basically operate as the the shaft in a plane and that's how that would control and like you know that's not how you would fucking roll your plane um also rolling is kind of weird in battlefront anyways because it doesn't actually affect your turn because obviously it wouldn't because you're in you're in space so it makes sense that it wouldn't but rolling kind of like feels weird anyways which is another reason why it's also star wars so who gives yeah but it's also but it's the rolling feeling really pointless is one of the reasons why putting the roll like attached to the pitch feels really fucking weird because there's no reason why i need to do that really like you could have taken that feature out and it it kind of would have raised my eyebrow at it because you kind of want to be able to spin around but also doesn't really fucking matter um so like they split up the controls in a crazy way but i knew that before going in and i specifically went in before loading starfighter assault to change it to like the normal ass way that any sane person want to play that game as and this is so that to my surprise when i loaded into the match i was flying around it's like this feels fucking insane what's going on and i realized Oh, that's like the control change must not have saved because this is the the way the default thing controls. And so like while I'm flying in the air and just like the my tie fighter is just like drifting forward as all these people are fighting, I'm going into the option menu with like okay, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, starfighter controls, like stick layout, and it's like that is still like South Paw Legacy or whatever the fuck it, it like the changed one is. It's like that doesn't say default. That's the one I picked. I was like, I changed it back to default. Like knocked out of the pause menu went back into the top pause menu and changed it back to the one i wanted and went back out and it still didn't change like 
what the fuck? And so then eventually after trying to, <laughs> vaguely trying to get used to it and being like, this is an impossible way to play this game. I have no idea. They must have like, like actual like Star Wars aliens working at DICE that designed these controls because it is so insanely unintuitive. Like even if, you know, it's, it's super unintuitive if you've ever played any video game ever before and you're used to the like the conventions. But even if like, fuck the conventions, just in like a, regardless of your experience, the, just a rational way of approaching how to design the controls, it makes no sense. So I backed out, went to the main menu, was like, okay, I'm gonna do this again. I, I think I even went, I like, I quit out of the beta, loaded back into the beta, went in and changed the controls again, and went to the match, and it still wasn't changed. I don't know if this was a like a widespread thing or not, because I know that there are some people for whom that worked, because well, in the video I watched, they changed the controls and it worked, but I found it, I cannot talk to you about the quality of the Starfighter Assault mode, because I could not fucking play it because the controls would not fucking change. It is a beta, so that's fine. So here's, but don't fuck it. Like, if you're designing your controls, did design it for a sane person. I, it must be like they must have gotten got the person who like designed the N64 controller to come over and like take a look. It's like, what can we do to fuck up something that should not be fuck upable at all? It's like let's just split off the two most important movement functions. It would be like if you played a first person shooter and forward and back on the left stick moved your character forward and backwards, and left and right on the left stick looked left and right, and if on the right stick pushing forward and back looked up and down, and pushing right and left moved right and left. It's like. This is insane. Nobody would ever fucking play this this way. Here's the thing about the Battlefront. The new Battlefront games to me, Sean, that I just fundamentally don't get. And I, I'm yeah. judging Battlefront 2 without playing it. But I trust you. If you, you play so Battlefront 1, you, you I, know like the basics of it. It doesn't play that yeah. differently. I, Star Wars has a long history of having video games that are successful because they're really good and they're real video games. Yes, some of the best video games I've ever played are Star Wars video games. You know, dating back to like the Super Star Wars games on Super NES yeah. are really great side-scrolling action games. That Some amazing Star Wars arcade games as well. Some amazing Star Wars arcade games up to the modern era where you have the original Battlefront games and you know all these LucasArts games, yeah. but you also have you know things they farmed out to like Bioware, like Knights of the Old Republic. And these games are big hits and they have, you know, cultural capital and all these things because they were made by, you know, a team making a real video game yeah. for real video game players. Not this imaginary casual gamer that really doesn't exist yeah. that is there to play like dumbed down baby's first, first person shooter Battlefront because that market doesn't really exist. You have to like come out from a core audience outwards and people are going to be pulled in and learn how to play it. Not the other way around yeah. where people who actually go and buy games and buy video game consoles are going to dumb down their expectations to play crap. Like yeah. it's such a weird strategy to me. I don't and and again, Dice should know how to do this better. Like and yeah. I assume it's not all their choice. Like these are talented people making these games. Battlefield isn't like this, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's, like, yeah. Battlefield isn't my kind of thing, but it's a real video game. Yeah. And it's just, it's bizarre to me because this is not how you make a hit in this medium. It's yeah. not. Like, you know, so much of making a hit in this medium these days is making a game interesting and deep enough that people will, like, make videos of it and talk about it online and share clips and stuff. No one did that for Battlefront 1. No one's going to do that for Battlefront 2. And eventually we're all just going to talk about the movie anyway and ignore this thing. Yeah. Because it has nothing to distinguish it. I don't get it. And here's my last thought. Sean, in two years, uh -huh. we're going to have J.J. from Star Wars Episode Nine. Yes. Yeah. And we're probably going to have a game called Star Wars Battlefront Three in stores. Yeah. How much of a like knife in the gut is that going to feel like for a lot of people? Yeah, I, I hadn't given it much thought until you just said it like that. But it's we're, gonna, true. we're finally going to get Battlefront Three. It's just not the one you want. Yeah, you'll you'll find me on the day that that comes out, looking at like the leaked fucking like production video or whatever for like from the like released two years or whatever after pandemic, the original Battlefront two studio shut down of their like prototypes of how you would start on a planet and fly up in a starship through space up to a space battle that was happening. It's like the fucking ambition that was there for console shooters at the time with that they were doing with the, those Battlefront games was so awesome. And then now we're getting like this really, like you said, like like my first 
person shooter, my first first person shooter. I'm imagining it was like a little golden book. Like, yeah, you know. it's, it's like this Fisher Price version of a first person shooter that's such an insane thing when you have this really competitive market that is extraordinarily popular, has been extraordinarily popular for it, like since ever, ever in video games, you know, since like Quake or whatever, like multiplayer first person shooters have been so huge and so core. And there are lots of different kinds of first person shooters that serve a, like lots of different markets. So you can have overwatch and you can have like you know whatever call of duty is a call of duty of the year and you can have fucking battlefield one you can have all these games and then like battlefront then now battlefront 2 feels like they don't have any idea of where to try to fit in that conversation even though like there's so many tools available to you in that ip of star wars that the pandemic studio recognized back in the day and were trying to use that other games did not have like doing these big incredible really ambitious space battles and then moving to having like a a like multiplayer match that is split between a ground battle and a space battle that you can move seamlessly in between that's still something that no fucking game has ever done and i would, and and like that idea is still just out there for dice to like go ahead and use and they just seem content to to like make kind of like the easiest first person shooter they can and my worry is that jokes about battlefront 3 aside if battlefront 2 underperforms again I think the actual end result of all this is eventually Disney's just going to pull the license and not make Star Wars games anymore. Yeah, and like that the Disney lesson... has a long history of just saying like, ah, eh, this video game thing didn't work out so well. We're just going to stop doing it. And everyone's like, it's because you didn't even fucking try. You didn't even yeah. try. The lesson should be Star Wars games were successful for like 30 years. Yeah. Do that again. Not, oh, we tried it twice as just utter dog shit and it didn't, no one liked it. Yeah, let's just go back to making more mobile games. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, All right, finishing off our stuff portion before we get to the news. I have a few things, but I'll go through them really quickly because we're running out of time on this. Yeah. All right, Uh, piece number one. I got the game Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga plus Bowser's Minions for the 3DS for my birthday. Thanks, Thomas. And I I have not had enough. Like I've been doing other things and I haven't gotten super deep into it, but I've played like three hours and I love it. Superstar Saga is a great Mario & Luigi game. Or just a great Mario RPG. Like, it's one of the, like, three pillars. You've got, you know, the original Square Enix Mario RPG, Paper Mario for the N64, and Superstar Saga. And everyone has, like, the one that's their touchstone. Superstar Saga was kind of my touchstone as a kid, because I played that on the GBA. This is a really cool remake. Um, I know some people were worried about how it looked in, like, trailers. Again, like, 3DS footage just doesn't look that great on YouTube. Yeah, when you blow it up, it's not going to look great. On my 3DS, I think it looks great. I I agree, like, some of the sprite work might not be as interesting as it was on the GBA, but the environments and the color and everything are really lovely, and it's... It's a, it's a 2D only 3DS game and there are actually some moments where I wish it was in 3D because there's some really cool stuff going on with the graphics. But it is Superstar Saga. It's, it looks great. It sounds great. Um, I love that game to death and I'm, I'm excited to play more of it. It's, a, it's like most Mario RPGs. You look at it on the surface and think it's a gimmick and then you get into it like this is surprisingly funny and deep and interesting. Right. So it's a good game. Uh, and I'm glad it's back because the, the the actual Mario and Luigi like sequels released for the 3DS have not been that interesting. So anyway, there's that. Um, I've continued to play with my SNES Classic, which I love, and I I love it even more because the second I I talked about last week, the first game I played through to completion was Super Metroid because sure, I just yeah. played Metroid uh, Samus Returns. So this the next one I went to was one I'd really been excited for the SNES Classic for, which is Yoshi's Island, right. the original Yoshi's Island, which. Uh, had had n- literally never been re-released by Nintendo because it's one of the Super FX chip games. So the right. only re-release it's ever had is the GBA version. And then the GBA version was re-released on Wii U and, and things. And uh, the Ambassadors program of the 3DS. And that's how I had played Yoshi's Island before. And I've always liked it. But playing it like the original Super NES version with its in its full glory in this really nice Super NES classic emulation... That is one of the most gorgeous games ever made. Like, if you made that today as a retro throwback, you'd be like, wow, they never could have done this on the Super NES. But we know they could because they made this game on it. Right. It's also like, I, I think Yoshi's Island, it obviously has a big reputation. I still think it might be slightly underrated how hmm. just how great that game is. It is a A-plus, top-notch, all-timer platformer. And I might like it even more than Super Mario World. If we're, like, taking Jeez. the two, like... I know, you know, Yoshi's Island is a peripheral Mario game, but it is called in its original release Super Mario World 2, so they're comparable. I might like it. Like, I think it's a really, really amazing game. And to the point where, like, there have been multiple Yoshi's Island sequels, and they're fine, and they're good. I kind of hope they come up with a new way to do Yoshi games in the future, because it's just one of those things where, like, you can't top that. 
kind of like how Mario games very rarely just do the same thing as the last Mario game because right. like how are you going to top Super Mario World? You don't. There wasn't a Super Mario World. To, okay, there was a game called Super Mario World Two: Yoshi's Island. But <laughs> we're not, literally talking about Super Mario World Two. But Yoshi's that's Island. my point. It's nothing like Super Mario World, you know. So like. That's the thing. But anyway, Yoshi's Island is amazing, and I was glad. I don't know if I've ever actually beat that game to completion before, like on the GBA, and it's got such a cool final boss fight with the uh, Baby Bowser stuff. That is a great game, so I'm enjoying my journey with the SNES Classic. But all of these things have been pushed aside because, kind of out of nowhere, they put out Stardew Valley on the Nintendo Switch. Oh, God, Jonathan. And I bought it. Jonathan. And I fell down that rabbit hole. It's, I have things to do. And I've put 20 hours into Stardew Valley. Jonathan! Yes. No! Bad Jonathan! No! We, we've done this! We've been down this hole, this fucking it's capitalist nightmare you've ensconced yourself in. <laughs> Liberate yourself, man! Stardew Valley is the most terrifyingly addictive game I've ever played. And on the Switch, it's too terrifyingly addictive. It's like when they put, like, gambling on phones. And it's like, this is bad for people. Stardew Valley is... I'm not losing money, but I am losing productivity. Like, the game only cost me like 10, 15 bucks, whatever it was. But it's like, I've played... I'm, I'm, and I've also, I want to say, I've pretty much broken the flow of the game because I know it so well from my first playthrough. I'm in year two. I already have $200,000. I've used up all the farmable space on my farm and like built it out and I have all the plants I'm ever going to be able to plant there. I have my house fully upgraded and I've almost married Emily, the blue-haired girl, who I hope does not cheat on me with the way Abigail, the purple-haired girl, does. Go back to last year's podcast if you want to hear about yeah, that. The weird but story. like, I am, and it's just again, I'm living out this like addictive capitalist nightmare where I am making all this money, but for what? But for what? It's like you just think if you like think about the opportunity cost of this game is inflicting on your life. It is because like again, like the Super NES Classic is sitting right there, and I remember a few weeks ago I went to it and I'm like, I'm finally going to play Final Fantasy three, and then I thought, you know, I probably just don't have enough time right now, and it's like I could have beat Final Fantasy three in the time I've spent playing Stardew Valley. Start you the time you spent playing Stardew Valley again. again. And that's a really <laughs> important detail. It'd be one thing if like you were playing Stardew Valley for the first time. Sure, fine, put twenty hours into it. Well, who cares? But you've already done this a year ago. Like, you know, normally here I would talk about the quality of the port, and it's really good. It's it's beautiful. It's colorful. It looks better than it did on my Mac. Plays better. Like Diablo 3 or something, this game is so much better suited to a controller than it is keyboard and mouse. and Or at least felt that way to me. Sure. No, Diablo, that's a controversial opinion, but a lot yeah. of people would say that about Diablo 3. I, I anyway. would say that about Diablo yes. 3, and I played so, Diablo 1 and 2 when they were new. Yes. Anyway, so like, I would talk about all that, you know, recommended asterisk, it's terrifyingly addictive. And I know not all people think this way. I've seen some people who seem to be able to play this game healthily. I cannot. And especially when it's on the Switch where, like, I'm watching John Pertwee Doctor Who and I can just take the Switch out of no. its dock no. and, and pick up corn while I'm watching Roger Delgado be Just evil. watch Doctor Who! Just... Just watch it. You don't need to fucking Look, you destroy take, yourself in Stardew Valley while you're watching Doctor you, Who. You take my own, like, ADHD, and you take the Nintendo Switch for Stardew Valley, and you take, you know, me having too much free time, and it's, it's fucked up. It really is. I feel like, you know, because <laughs> we're, we're going to talk about Blade Runner 2049 at the end of this podcast. And Blade Runner 2049 opens with a, a like, opening scroll thing that's, like, reminiscent of the original Blade Runner. I feel like they missed a beat in not saying, in the year 2017, Stardew Valley was released for the Nintendo Switch. And then just going, and then cut into this dystopian <laughs> nightmare that we live in because, because fucking Stardew Valley was released. Fucking that game, man. Let's move on to some news. All right, what's happening in the news, you fucking maniac? Speaking of fucking maniacs. <laughs> okay, is that that's the segue we're using? Yeah, and speaking of capitalist nightmare like landscapes we've I don't as know. a society have crafted for themselves, let's talk about Hardy Weinstein. Look, I want to say up front, I apologize for that transition. It wasn't good. I don't think there was a good transition I could have made no. there. Because we're going from we're talking about silly shit to very not silly shit. Yeah. And here's the thing, you know... I don't know what we have as two white guys to add to this conversation about Harvey Weinstein that has not, you know, been said substantively, but I also felt we would have been reticent not to talk about it at least a little bit yeah. because what happened over the last two weeks and really the last, you know, week and a half is, you know, one of, if not arguably the, at various points in, in history, most powerful men in Hollywood 
was fully revealed and proved to be a serial sex predator and, you know, like serial to, rapist, basically. To, to an absurd degree. Like, an, like like over the course of decades. To a Bill Cosby degree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like, even even like worse in some ways. Like like the 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 fucking like frequency yes. and and like range of victims. Oh, I like, mean God, not I, to obviously not to lighten anything of like Bill Cosby's sins, but it's like the fucking the Harvey Weinstein stuff is is you always suspect that like people that are in that degree of power that are behind the scenes are really fucked up and do fucked up stuff occasionally but that that's like that's something that if you saw that in a movie you would think that would be absurd yeah i it's you know i and just the list of women you know women you may not have heard of before and the list of seriously powerful hollywood women and if you i think one of the things that is hopefully instructive to all of us about the culture of victim blaming is understanding that you know if a woman as powerful as Gwyneth Paltrow or Angelina Jolie did not feel empowered to come out about these things, that tells you that there is a systemic cultural issue. This is not people being cowardly or anything like yeah. that. The way you know people to try to minimize this will say, this was you know as as we were saying systemic over decades. And Harvey Weinstein, I think it's possible you know younger people today don't know much about him. Because he has not been as big a figure in recent years, but I mean the '90s and the 2000s, uh, especially yeah. you know the Miramax years, and then the height of the Weinstein Company, and still Weinstein. There's at least one Weinstein Company movie every year that's in Oscars talk or you know zeitgeist consideration. Like all of uh, Quentin Tarantino's movies are through with the Weinstein Company, and those are probably the most high-profile ones in recent years. Um, you know, this is again one of the most powerful gatekeepers in Hollywood. Who is systemically, you know, um, assaulting and harassing and, in the most extreme cases, raping women. And it was, you know, and there's this, there's this decree also of, like, there's a whole culpability, I think, with it, within the industry of, I don't think the victims, but, you know, men and people, other people in power who knew about this who didn't say anything. Like, the other people at the Weinstein Company... I see yeah. you, Bob Weinstein. I don't believe a fucking thing you're saying right now. You need to be out of your job, too. Because you enabled this shit. But, like, you know, this wasn't a quote-unquote open secret to a lot of people in the industry. And even if you were on the outside looking in, it's clear this guy was a fucking creep and asshole. But still to have the New York Times and the New Yorker were the two primary ones that released pieces um, detailing, you know, to the like they had this guy dead to rights on all this stuff. It is sobering and terrifying. Yeah, and, and it is just like there was that initial, like, huge story. And then it, it was like... You know, it's one of the things that I'm kind of glad that we're... It's one of the benefits of having missed that week is, is like, all the fallout from that. Of There have been so many other stories coming out. In the way that, like, always happens with something like this, it is, it is not... There's, like, the one... There's, like, this this slow amassing of all these stories over a long period of time. And then there's, like, that one one that, like, just sort of, like, that pinprick that bursts the bubble. This is, like, just out and out. Like, this is who this is. This is what he did. And then, then that makes it sort of safe for everyone else to come up and be like yes like this is my story also and adding that to the pile and that's like i feel like we have seen a number of these kinds of things happen over the, like the past couple of years and then over the past couple of weeks with different figures and this is the one that just felt like every single second you're just seeing like another story and 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 like it's still happening and it's it will be happening for a while the the larger cultural context is one i'm really interested in because you know, I was having a, a family dinner the other night and my mom brought this up and said, and, you know, she's not that into like pop culture. Um, you know, she's in her late 50s. She's not on her phone all the time or anything. Right. But like, you know, she brought up, um, she said, like, why is this happening so frequently now that I'm hearing about like sexual harassers all the time? Like, why is this thing? Ha-? And it's like, well, and I had to explain, like, it's not new. <laughs> this has been go- like Harvey wants is a great example of this. This is an old problem because he's been in the industry forever. And, you know, multiple generations of young women um, were assaulted by this guy. It's what we're, we're, us hearing about it at this volume and frequency in mainstream media. That's what is quote unquote new. And I do think it's an interesting phenomena. And, you know, I'm going to bring up his name. It does have to do with the election of Donald Trump to some degree, which is that we put a sex pred, a serial sex predator in the White House and you better believe it started. It's like this flood that drove all the rats out of their hidey holes. 
One, in that it enabled a lot of people, and you can't ignore that. But two, in that it, I think it emboldened a lot of reporters and, and women and people uh, you know, who had voices and needed to speak out to go after these stories, to start speaking out. I think there's so much less tolerance in the current climate yeah. to just let these stories slide. And you know, I think there is something really scary to think about in that this, you know, everything we've seen means there's a lot more shoes to fall. You know, this might be the biggest at the moment, but it's not going to be for long. Um, but it also means that, you know, the, the people who reported this at various outlets, prob- you know, there were either them or other people probably could have gone after these stories in the past. And I'm not blaming those people, but it is like, you know, only now do we seem to have this cultural moment where like yeah. outlets and newspapers are giving resources for these investigative reports, which are super important because this is what gets light on these things and will force hopefully some kind of, you know, change and reflection. But, you know, this cultural moment, it's, it's, we have to realize we're hearing about it more. That doesn't mean that this is new. Yeah. And, no. and what it tells us is that it's a systemic issue that needs so much work and attention from all of us. And whether, you know, you have, even if you're not completely on the outside looking in, like I think we are, we're not like in the industry or anything, you know, there is just when you see these kind of things or, or hear about that, like amplifying those voices is, is going to be, it has always been important and is going to be so much more important going forward. Yeah. And it is, it's just part of this, I think like movement that is, has been happening for a while, but is gaining more steam of that, like a culture of like understanding around gender issues and, and power issues and, and that kind of stuff. And, and like, and like a more sort of like broader social understanding of things like, of like, you know, concepts like rape culture that allow that sort of framework for people to be able to one, like it gives them the framework and kind of like the language to understand what is happening and kind of like approach that problem. And then also to create this larger culture of sort of like acceptance of, of like speaking out against these people and saying like, yes, like, like if you, if something like this happened to you, speak out against, if you, and you speak out, like we will have your back. And there's like a large, large group of people that will have your back in these instances, which is one of the things you need to create that sense of culture to fight people like Harvey Weinstein that use their power and influence to silence and intimidate and coerce people to do things for them. In this instance, like like coerce women to perform sexual favors for him in different ways. It's like that culture of silence that is produced by his power is what allows a predator like that to sort of exist at the top of that food chain. And we have to like, it's, it's the responsibility of everybody to help create a culture that fights against that and says, no, that's wrong. And we're not going to accept that, like at any level, like it, like whether it's, whether it's at your like you work at a fucking grocery store and your superintendent or whoever is like doing something there when they're there, like you know on that level as well. That's important. It's not just the Harvey Weinstein's yeah. of the world. The Harvey Weinstein's of the world are in every sector. Oh, that's been one of the the lessons of 2017. Certainly, if you didn't know it already, is and and you know mostly it seems like it's it's the the men in the audience who weren't thinking about this because you know I don't think there's a lot of surprise from a lot of women in these industries that this is the case. But you know um, from all the stuff that all the shoes that dropped at Fox News, yeah. and in politics, and in sports, and in you know uh, film on all sides of the film aisle recently, not just you know this is a producer. But we've had all the stories this year also about all the people in film coverage that we talked about a few uh, weeks ago on the podcast. Um, you know, it is. It's absolutely everywhere. And, you know, I, I am heartened by the fact that I didn't, you know, I think people were very swift to denounce Harvey Weinstein. And, you know, the Academy kicked him out, which I applaud. And, you know, I think I think every most everyone said the right things. You have a couple of asshole responses. Yeah. But, you know, I, I did not see a lot of Hollywood people, you know, saying like, but his company made such great movies, but, you know, which is the stupidest fucking excuse in the world. I didn't see a lot of that. At the same time, you know, Harvey Weinstein is someone, you know, journalism and people coming forward were able to nail to the wall really definitively. Like, you can't deny it because the facts are so overwhelming. Yeah. Kind of in a, in a Bill Cosby sense. But, you know, the Academy kicked Harvey Weinstein out. They've still got Roman Polanski and and actually Bill Cosby and like Woody Allen in there. And I'm also seeing like Woody Allen's new film just premiered at some film festival and people are talking about like, what are its Oscar chances? And it's like, 
You really didn't learn the lesson. Yeah. That you enabled a guy like Harvey Weinstein for 20 fucking years by giving him all this free coverage about his Oscar bait bullshit, blah, blah, blah. And, okay, he's a rapist and all this stuff. That's terrible. And then, like, Woody Allen, who molested one daughter and married the other. And right. we know this, you know. Um, has a new movie come out. It's like, what are its Oscar chance? Shut up! Shut up! Stop talking about the movie. You're, you're, you cannot criticize Harvey Weinstein with one hand and talk about, like... You know, ooh, how is Hollywood going to receive Woody Allen's new movie with the other hand? Shun them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, and people are like, but at some point you have to separate the art from the artist. I don't care when they're like a complete monster. Maybe just watch someone else's art. It's not that hard. Yeah. There are plenty of artists who aren't rapists. You know, like, that. I don't know why this is a point I have to make. Yeah. You know, that, that that that's pretty self-evident to me. Yeah, I've always felt like that, like, separate the art from the artist thing. It made sense to me when I was in, in college because we were talking about artists that were have been dead for 2,000 years. It's like, I have no idea who this person was. They are so far long dead. Like, fair enough in that instance. Like, the, the stretch of time is long enough. I don't give a shit who that person was. Like... We're talking about people who are alive and making things right now. Like, that's not the same fucking situation. No. We're not talking about the same thing. Like, yeah. you know, I can, I can separate the art from the artist when it's fucking like H.P. Lovecraft, the dude has been dead for a century. Yes, he was racist. Yes, his racism exists in his works. And that's something you like take into account and you study those works. But there's no risk of like, you're not contributing directly to a racist by buying a collection of H.P. Lovecraft short stories. Yeah. You are contributing like financially to a child molester when you go in and pay money for a Woody Allen movie. Yeah, like yeah, the Woody Allen thing is especially like the double talk there is just crazy to me because it's like again and, and I, you know, went through a journey on this where I didn't want to believe it when I started hearing that because I've liked some of Woody Allen's movies. But eventually it's like just be a human and be empathetic about it. And then, you know, if you're an actor, stop being in his movies. If you're a distributor, stop funding his movies. And if you're the fucking Oscar, stop nominating his manager of the trade. Stop talking about it. Just that's how you get, you know, that's, this is the power we give these people, which allows them to be abusive. And, you know, like today there was the whole thing. Some outlet asked Woody Allen for his thoughts on Harvey Weinstein. And of course he gave a really sexist, horrible response. Yeah. As you would expect, you know, and, but there's always going to be problems with reaction to any of these things. Not an excuse, but, well, you know, nothing's perfect. You know, on one hand, um, it's heartening that, you know, finally this guy is seen for what he is. Horrible that it had to take this long. But, you know, hopefully this opens a lot of eyes and opens a lot of hearts and allows for scenarios where this kind of thing will not be allowed to perpetuate as much in the future, I hope. But at the same time, you know, the more I hear about this, I don't feel optimistic. I feel horrible and sick about all of this because end of the day, as many of these sexist whack-a-moles we whack down, well, you know what? The ones, there's got one sitting in the Oval Office. Right. And we're not addressing that. Like it sickens me that like every, you know, New York Times article about Donald Trump should start with Donald Trump, you know, quote, president of the United States, serial sex predator, and under FBI investigation for obstruction of justice. Yeah. Like that needs to be like the context we're putting it in and we don't. And a lot of these issues, as long as there's, you know, we allow this at the absolute top, it doesn't matter where else we whack all these. I mean, it does matter in so yeah. much as each one has meaning and weight, but it just feels especially hopeless now where like you could seriously have like a, a, a journalist I saw, you know, on TV ask Donald Trump for his reaction on Harvey Weinstein. And it's like, it's just the same fucking thing. Yeah. You know, and... And it's just this... I, I know I'm slightly incoherent about all this, but I don't know how you how you can be co coherent about this perfectly. It's it's sickening and horrifying. Yeah. It's the kind of thing, like, you have to you have to, to take solace in that, you know, that Harvey Weinstein can't do this shit anymore. Like, that's, like... That's, yes. One thing to always, like, focus on. And then also, it's just important, again, to keep in mind, is I think there can be a tendency to... When, when something like this happens, when you have this, like, really huge figure like Harvey Weinstein that, that like, has been, like you said, like, nailed to the wall with, like, the, the largest and, like, most definitive accumulation of evidence I've ever seen in something like this. It's absurd. And so fast. Yeah, like, so even fast. The, even the Bill Cosby thing was a drip, drip over time. Yeah, you know? and this, it's just, like, 
was immediate and like so many like verifiable facts from like like multiple witnesses that all know about like these different instances like things happening like every single one was so just like there's no this is not like hearsay this is not he said she said to any degree like this is all like incredibly verifiable definitive evidence is like it's so rare in these kinds of instances because it, tend, it tends to be really hard to get like any other source other than the the you know the assaulter and the person who's been assaulted and because Harvey Weinstein has fucking like used assistants and secretaries and all these people to sort of like commit these actions where we have like other verified other verifiable sources in this instance but one thing you need to always keep in mind is that like Harvey Weinstein is that's not the source of the problem and it's also not Donald Trump like as bad as fucking Donald Trump obviously is that like this is something that happens all the time in every sector of society that there are always going to be people who abuse their power and and use their and abuse their power to coerce people into our sexual favors from people and to abuse them and hurt them and injure them just because it's something that they can do by abusing their power and because it amuses them to do so that's something that happens all the time and you and you can't just sort of like say like okay we we took care of harvey weinstein like good job we're done that's not how the problem ends I, you know i think to me the lessons are you know what can you do we do as like again straight white guys I mean, number one is always check your own behavior. Yeah, yes. And, yeah. and reflect on anything you might have done that, um, you know, this throws into some other relief for you. Or that, you know, some kind of behavior. You know, and most people don't do the, the worst things like this. Yeah. But everyone has, you know, makes, mis you know, um, mistakes and needs to mature in dealing with other people. And the number one thing, again, is to check your behavior and always be cognizant of those things. Number two is to check other people's behavior and always be cognizant of those things, as we said yeah. before. And I'm not in any order, but, you know, number three is also believe and amplify women when they talk about these things. And that's one of the things we can all easily do and should do. And, you know, again, um, you know, it, it's not... I, I was inspired by how many women showed the courage to come forth and talk so eloquently about these horrible things because I can't even imagine what that's like. Yeah. But I also don't even want to use the word inspired because it's such a grotesque situation. But it is, of course, important to recognize that that's a heroic action that so many people took in, in this story coming out. Yeah. And we'll have to sadly continue to take. Yeah. For more people like this to go down. Uh, anyway. The world sucks. Yep. <laughs> Well, welcome, welcome to the world, Jonathan. It sucks. Go back to playing Stardew Valley. You can you can shelter yourself from it all. Just just pick more carrots or whatever bullshit you do in that game. You can't plant carrots in that game. Well, but you can't you can't farm carrots. I I did go back to Stardew Valley for a second. Okay. I'm also now <laughs> discovering things in that game I didn't know I could do before. Like I've figured out how to make and uh, age wine and cheese. And how debonair of you. Just, it's just, I have a whole cellar where I'm doing this, and, and it's like, and I just, I was about ready to maybe put the game away when I figured this stuff out. So it's just, oh, it's no. always, it's always pulling me in further. Um, let's transition. As long as you stay in Stardew Valley, you don't have to think about the rest of the world. It's okay. All right, let's talk about other things. Um, this is a silly piece of news, but I wanted to bring it up. Okay. So, Doctor Who Series 10, which was a great season of television. Yes, it was. Fantastic. Uh, is coming out on Blu-ray and DVD this November, uh, 13th slash 14th US, UK. And we got some official press releases about it this week. Normally, I wouldn't bring this up, but did you see the cover art for the UK edition yeah, of did. Doctor Who yeah. Series 10? I just, I'm obsessed with it, and I need people yeah. to know about it. And if you haven't seen it, I want you to Google it and, like, go to Amazon UK and look it up because it's so good. I'm on the fence. I might have to, like, import this version of the set just for that cover art. If you haven't seen it, it's like a white background with Peter Capaldi doing his best, you know, stare. Yeah. And, like, the eyebrows. And it, within that is, like, a version of the Series 10 key art, which is the standard, like, U.S. other countries cover art. And then it's got, like, the five-star, like, review quotes from, like, different outlets. It looks like the cover to, like... You know, a prestige TV drama, yeah. not Doctor Who. And and Doctor Who has kind of become that for me. So I'm just obsessed with it and I love that. Yeah, you're right. It does it looks like it would be the box cover for like a re-release of The Wire or The Sopranos or it something does, yes. instead of Doctor Who. It does feel but like, yeah, for the Peter Capaldi run, it feels very appropriate. It does. The little gravitas that like he has brought to the show and the other writers have brought to the show in the past three years is like, yeah, 
You fucking, you've earned this one. I'm just like, because I have a extensive Doctor Who home media collection. I own yeah. everything of the modern series and some of the classic series. And, you know, they have a pretty standard house style. in, And the US and UK vary sometimes, but not all that much. This one, like, it's a completely different cover. And it fascinates me. And I want it here. And it makes me sad we're not getting it. But that's yeah. okay. Well, we get all the other stuff. Like, you know, the episodes and the bonus. The stuff that yeah. matters. But, yeah. I mean, you can't always just, like, print that out and put it on the box or something. I, I absolutely could. But anyway, it just fascinates me. And I wanted to mention that because it's a small good thing I can put into the world. Yes. Which is Peter Capaldi's awesome. He, he is amazing. He is. Uh, all right. Speaking of cool home video announcements, while we were off yeah. at New York City Comic Con, uh, a panel um, with people involved with this show... Uh, announced that Batman the Animated Series, which some might call the definitive screen version of Batman, I would. is coming to Blu-ray in 2018. Yes. Which seemed like an absolute utter pipe dream would never happen this time last year. But then they did Mask of the Phantasm on Blu-ray. Have you looked at that yet? I know I lent you my copy. I still have not had the time. Okay. Well, I don't one... have the time to do the podcast every week. I don't have the time to watch Mask of the Phantasm either. 70 minutes. You can do it. It's, it's, you anyway. know, if you can fucking play something other than Stardew Valley, maybe I'll, I'll watch Mask of the Phantasm. And uh, I guess that sold well enough that we are getting the entire animated series on Blu-ray in 2018. Yeah. Which is, again, I think we recapped this when Mask of the Phantasm came out. But I just have to say, like, if you don't know... <laughs> Like the thing about the animated series is that as great as it is and as cool as it is visually, on like home video releases, it's never looked all that good because like the masters made when the show was made just aren't in that good quality. There's a lot of things inherent in how it was animated that uh, factor into that. But that means that if it was ever to get a really good modern release, it would take an extensive restoration, which we don't get a lot of anymore on yeah. home video. But especially I guess, not for like an animated show. No, but I guess Batman is big enough. That we're going to get that. And that is so awesome. Because that is a show. I have it on DVD. That is one of the shows I will absolutely rebuy on Blu-ray. Yeah. It's been a long time since I watched through Batman the Animated Series. I think I did that like when I was a freshman in college. Yeah. So. And Mask of the Phantasm. Like that Blu-ray. Like if you want to know why it's worth the upgrade. Watch that. It's amazing. Um, but I am very excited. Yeah. If, if, because also just like Batman the Animated Series is old enough now. That it's, like, it's been so long since it originally aired that... There's there are like generations of Batman fans that would have never just been introduced to that show. I think it helps that like this incarnation of Batman has been kept alive in the Rockstar games and every so often in the DC animated movies. Kevin yeah. Conroy and Mark Hamill come back and stuff. Most recently in the terrible Batman: The Killing Joke. Less said about that, the better. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, uh, this is so cool. And uh, the Warner Archive is just a really cool. This is something. There's something I actually forgot to talk about. This is coming through the Warner Archive, which is under the Warner Brothers banner, but is actually a very distinct division of Warner Home Video. Like, it's a completely different group of people, which is why you get really cool releases like this. Like, they actually do a much better job mastering their Blu-rays, creating features, doing restorations. The actual Warner Home Video is a pretty bare-bones operation these days. But Warner Archive, which is a... Like, this will be manufacturer on demand, is, is a really cool division. And did you see they actually just this month put out um, this new... Well, new old version of Superman the Movie? No, Did you cool. hear about this? No. Um, so I, I want to talk about this really. I forgot to put this on stuff, but I bought this and I watched it. It came out uh, like a week ago through the Warner Archive. Is There was a version of Superman the movie, the Richard Donner 78 film, that was made in the 80s where they, the Salkins, the producers, the evil producers who fired Richard Donner, right. um, took like all the available footage and made like a three-hour cut of the film for TV. And that huh. version was thought basically lost for years or that it only existed in like beta tapes for tv and like cropped for three and low quality and last year i guess people at the warner archive found in the vaults a full 35 millimeter interpositive of that cut of the film and they restored it and it's now out on blu-ray and that set also comes with a blu-ray of the special edition of the film which has been the definitive home video edition for years um and so you can watch the 188 minute cut of superman the movie so that's like another 38 minutes over the longest version of Superman. Yeah. And it is fascinating. I recommend buying it. It's a really interesting version of the film. If you, I mean, if you like the movie. If you don't like the movie, I don't know why you'd watch it. <laughs> right, but yeah. Like, it's like, no. if you don't like the movie, maybe you'd like 30 more minutes of it. Yeah, Here no. you go. Um, it's not a better version of the movie. Okay. I want to, like, dissuade you from that right now. I actually really do like the extensions to the first hour of the film. In this version, you don't see Christopher Reeve until one hour into the movie. Oh, jeez. But, like, that hour has some really cool stuff. And 
The second and third hours have some interesting stuff, but mostly once you get to Metropolis, it like slows the movie to a crawl. Like the scene where Otis is going to meet Lex Luthor and right, yeah. and like the people are tailing him. That's like 20 minutes in the extended cut. Oh, this whole thing where Otis goes and gets a pretzel. It's very, very long, but it's still neat to see like new Ned Beatty footage and right. new Gene Hackman footage. There's a lot more with Gene Hackman. Yeah. There, I mean, there's new Christopher Reeve stuff and good God, is it cool to see footage that you have maybe have not seen before of him? And just, like, it's a piece of film history. Because, again, this is not, like, the most artistic version of Superman. It was, again, the Salkins were complete crooks. Ask anyone. Like, the bonus features on these discs will tell you that. Like, they only made it this long because they, they like, they were selling it by the minute to ABC. And they're like, how much can we get out of this? Um, but it is still interesting. And the other thing is that it's the best-looking version of Superman, the movie I've seen on home video. Hmm. Because, um, like, the version, the normal Blu-rays were mastered in, like, 2010, so, like, seven years right. ago. And this is seven years later. They had to remaster this version from scratch. And it just means with more modern tools... It looks really, really nice. Like I almost wish they would take some of these materials and remaster the actual, you know, special edition or something with some of these materials. Um, but it's really interesting. It's a fascinating cut of the movie. I did it in two nights, which is how it was aired on TV back in the day. That's sure. probably the most sane way to watch it. But that's that's one of the cool things Warner Archive is doing. And you get this Batman thing too. You know, hey, Justice League probably isn't going to be that good, but we're getting cool like ancillary stuff out of it. Yeah. And, and, like, you know, we talk a lot about on this podcast how, I mean, in, like, in re relation to Blade Runner, that, that home video releases really sort of went down in quality at some point. Uh -huh. And, yeah, it's always awesome to see that stuff come from, like, especially if it's, like, coming from someone other than Criterion that obviously, like, has made their whole business out of that. Yeah. And, yeah, someone that has access to all these old archives to be able to put out a weird, old, obscure, like, super long cut of Superman the movie. I'm down for that. Yeah, it's really interesting. I would recommend watching it if you like that movie just because it's it's fascinating. Like, another, another just one more example because it's hilarious to me is, you know, there's the whole part where Lex Luthor and Otis and Miss Tessmacher go to, like, hijack the missile? Yes, yeah. I don't remember how many attempts it is in the original version. It's two attempts in the extended cut that play out at full length where, like, huh. Otis does it and messes it up. And they realize that, and then they have to start over from scratch. I mean, it basically plays like an assembly cut. It goes on forever, but it is kind of fascinating to see, like, Lex Luthor, he's never really a scary villain in Superman 78. He seems especially toothless in this version when you watch all the repeated attempts to, like, get that missile in his control. That, that almost sounds like something from, like, a classic Doctor Who where they're like, oh, fuck, we have to do make four episodes out of the script. Okay, like, let's have, okay, Harry Sullivan, you try to do this thing. You can't do it. Okay, now Sarah Jane Smith, you come in and you can do it. It's yeah. like, we're just doing the exact same thing. That's fine. We need five, four minutes of footage. All right. Uh, speaking of Justice League and movies... We've got a shit ton of movie trailers to talk about. Yeah. We haven't done, like, movie trailer theater in a while. So let's do this, Sean. All right. Let's, I'm going to roll up my sleeves. I'll, I'll save the two big ones for last. But, Video. Uh, or, sorry. Movie trailer theater. Uh, I did not know this first movie had even been shot. I didn't know there was going to be a trailer, but it was attached to Blade Runner 2049. And that's Pacific Rim Uprising. Right. Yes. Yeah. I'm happy this movie got made. Yeah, that looks Del, fun. Del Toro's not attached to it, though, so... Well, he's producing. Well, well I mean, he's not directing it. Yeah, he didn't yeah. direct it. He is, I mean, he handpicked Stephen okay. DeKnight or whatever. He's an active producer on it, so it's all with his blessing. Okay. But yes, it is a different team creatively, but it's, I mean, it's still giant robots fighting giant monsters. Yes, and, and it looks like it's got a bit more of that almost, like, Voltron-y, like, this kind of, like, the so. team aspect to it that they're emphasizing a bit more. Which, obviously, that existed in Pacific Rim 1, but it was much more about, like, the yeah. core pair. I like that, I mean, I thought this was a fun trailer. Yeah, I like the trailer as well. Uh, it, you know, it looks like, um, like, very, they're doing, like, a ten years later thing, mostly new cast. There are some returning cast members, um... The, the Matsuki, whatever. Uh, Ringo Kikuchi. Yeah, Ringo yeah. Kikuchi. Her, her character is Matsuki. I wasn't yeah. just trying to make up a Japanese name. Yeah. Yeah, Ringo Kikuchi, who I love, is going to be in it, but she's not in the trailer. Um, but mostly they showed the new characters, which I think is a good idea for a Pacific Rim sequel. And John Boyega, who's <laughs> awesome in Star Wars, yeah. is here playing Idris Elba's son with the same cool accent. I yeah. love it. Yes, it's very, it's, it's the, one of those things of, you know, because he's an actor I haven't seen in much, and like the, the biggest thing I've seen him in is Star Wars that I always have to, it's one of those things you have to adjust, it's like, right, he's British, right, he's British. <laughs> yes. It's like, it's just one of those weird things you have to get used to with, with you know, American actors that's like, oh wait, they're not, sometimes they're not American actors. Yeah, no, but he's awesome. 
It just it looks like a fun movie. I like that you know we're getting more Pacific Rim. Yeah, it's, it's this like weird sort of like resurgence of the kaiju type movie thing. You know, with I still need to get around to watching Kong Skull Island because that's oh, you'd now love available it. on Blu-ray, and it, because of the, like the new Godzilla stuff coming from Japan and like new Godzilla stuff from America, then and Pacific Rim is just a whole lot of giant monsters and giant robots, and I'm always down for that. This is another sequel though where I do question why they didn't just make it in Chinese with Chinese actors because the only reason this movie is getting funded is it was huge in China. Right. It did not do huge here. It's being it, there's a sequel because China wants it, not yeah. us. I mean, I feel like like the the first movie wasn't even really set at all in America. Like it, no, like everywhere but America, basically. Yeah. So like, and I don't mind. I'm just saying, like, eventually we are going to get a major Hollywood sequel just made in China. Sure. Yeah. I like it's going to have to happen because that's where the money is going. And I like I would have expected Pacific Rim would have to be a candidate for that. Yeah. But no, I it looks fun, and um, yeah. So that's one trailer. Um, another trailer that was unexpected, but in a different way. Did you see the trailer for the New Mutants? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I don't know a ton about the New Mutants comics from the '80s, other than people love them. It's Cla- Chris Claremont, yeah. and it's like a really beloved kind of young adult kind of style comic series about young mutants. Yes. And that's what I thought the movie was going to be. Uh-huh. And you know they cast people like Maisie Williams, who are really recognizable because of Game of Thrones and stuff. And uh, then the trailer came out, and it's like the most generic slasher movie trailer, but it's about the X-Men. It could be a good movie. I don't yeah. want to be prejudiced, but it was like, did I play the wrong trailer? Yeah, it was something of where, because I mean, the reason why I watched the trailer is I saw like I saw you and then like, a number of other people on Twitter talking about the movie and like like saying like, what, this is the next X-Men movie? Like, what's with this like really generic horror movie trailer? And I was like... That sounds crazy, and I watched the trailer, and then like for the it's you know it's like a ninety second trailer or something. Yeah. And for the first sixty seconds, I was like, well, the, like this definitely is kind of a horror movie trailer, but it, like people are going overboard. And then like the last thirty seconds started, I'm like, oh yes, this is this is the most generic horror movie trailer you could possibly cut together. I have no idea how representative that is of the movie. I've only read like one New Mutants thing that I got as like a a trade paperback. A very long time ago, I don't even I don't I not even own it anymore, and I vaguely remember it having some kind of like I think it was New Mutants, and it it had almost like an Island of Doctor Moreau kind of thing, but I don't think it was not like the first story arc or anything like that. So I don't have a huge amount of experience with it either. I my vague recollection of it, of it was of it being a little bit more horror oriented, um, but yes, I was not expecting. I just like this especially get like the last thirty seconds of like the cut cut scream like cut to black like in like this like really fast sort of like shutter cut to black with the image like in the cut it cut it cut 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 it's like what the fuck because it's not even a kind of thing where they're trying to leverage like this is x-men and you love x-men no it's just being like they have a couple references to mutants but it's being marketed just as its own standalone horror thing yeah and i should say x-men has been at its best recently when they've gone for like specific genre you know plays yes, like, like comedy lo- like western basically yeah, and then Logan, now or horror or like that legion show on fx which was like psychodrama and i have not seen that yet but i'm i've heard it's brilliant and i'm sure it is it's noah holly who did fargo but like that's where x-men has been successful recently and new mutants would fit completely into that trend if it's good yeah and it totally could be and i don't want to be too i actually deleted my tweet on that because i felt it was too mean right but like um because like i said what the hell is this and it's like oh well, i shouldn't be that mean to it but like it's just, it was, it was also like, by far the most recognizable person in that movie is Maisie Williams, and she's in one shot of the trailer. Yeah. So there were just a bunch of ways, like, my expectations were thrown for a loop. Again, I'm open mind. It could be great. X-Men has actually been on, if you, like, ignore Apocalypse, quite a role lately. Yeah. But, you know, we'll see. It's just that kind of thing of, of the, a trailer cut like that sets you up for a very bad movie, because most horror movies are very bad so and like that's just like the number one most generic way you can cut together a trailer to make sure that like a bunch of drunk college kids are going to watch it on netflix one night you know like yeah. that's exactly the kind of movie that trailer is cut as and there are plenty of great horror movies that have that kind of generic horror trailer that are really good movies regardless of that like obviously there's a huge disconnect between what a trailer is and what the movie is especially for horror yeah but it is it is it is very hard to watch that trailer and then like be excited for the movie because you're so psychologically set up for just like, um, this looks terrible. This looks like, you know, like one of the, like, what are they up to? Like insidious five or something at this point. It's like, fuck off. The first one wasn't even that good. 
Yeah. No, I again, I'm rooting for it. I want it to be good. Yes. Yeah. Josh Boone seems like a cool filmmaker. It's got a good cast, but we'll see. Maisie really, Williams was really good in Doctor Who. She's a great actress. She should be more stuff. If that Last of Us movie ever got made, she would be playing that character. By the time that movie would ever get made, no, she, she will would, have aged would out be too old to play Ellie. Yeah. yeah. And then you're kind of like, why make it? But yeah. we'll see. Um, all right. So let's see. Here are the two big trailers of the week, though. Yes. We got Star Wars The Last Jedi. We also got Justice League. Right. Right. That was in just in the last two weeks. Yeah. Here's the thing. Justice League has become a movie I am really excited for. Not in the sense of like, I want it in my life. I think it's going to be great. I, I'm going to have fun with it, like Thor Ragnarok or something. Right, or even yeah. Star Wars. Like, it's I'm excited because I want to know what the fuck this movie is. Yeah. Because this is the third major trailer, and it's the third different movie <laughs> we've yeah. seen. Like, and this one seems like it's the first trailer cut after like all of the Joss Whedon reshoots and everything. I mean, when I say it looks like a different movie, I mean that literally in that the color scheme, yeah. grain structure, and like just general look of it no longer looks like a Zack Snyder movie. Like, Zack Snyder, whatever his faults are, he has a very, very distinct look. Like, you can look at any frame of a Zack Snyder movie and say, that's Zack Snyder. Yeah. And it's, he uses a really heavy amount of, like, post-processed grain. He has a very specific dark color scheme, like, desaturated. Um, and, you know, you, you, there's still some of that slow-mo and stuff in there, but they're de-emphasizing yeah. it. This, this one looks, like, pretty bright, like, actually hot colors. You've got pretty active... Um, you know, movement in the frame. They've gotten rid of all the like, digital grain and all that stuff. Like, it looks more like, frankly, Avengers 1, like the Joss Whedon Avengers, than it does a Zack Snyder movie. And then on top of that, like, just the whole tone of it feels different. But, like, I don't know. And yeah, the other thought I had watching this was, if Batman v Superman didn't exist, or I hadn't seen it, or whatever, and this was just, like, maybe there had been different movies before this, but I was going to this cold, uh -huh. this would look okay. Sure. But so many of the... Th like, again, the first full minute of this trailer is trying to remind us, like, what about that amazing love story between Amy Adams, Lois Lane, and Henry yeah. Cavill's Superman? And it's like, no, you can't gaslight me. I saw it. They had no chemistry, and they fucked in a bathtub, and it seemed weird. Yeah, it's like... You, it it feels like whenever they're bringing up the Superman stuff, because it was like the last trailer talked about, like, oh, like, without Superman, who is our hope or whatever. It's no, like, no, no. It's, he, he didn't just inspire people. He made them see the best in themselves. Yeah, it, it feels like they keep on forgetting that they didn't make a Man of Steel 2. It's like someone at WB thinks they made a Man of Steel 2, where, where <laughs> Superman was Superman, but they never fucking made that movie. They made Man of Steel 1, of which he's not Superman at any point over that whole fucking movie. And then they made Batman v Superman, which where he's not even the main character of the movie. And, and he's everyone killed at the end. And the plot of the movie is the world hates him. Yeah, everyone hates him and he's killed at the end of it. It's like, you can't, there's no, there has been no relationship with him and Lois Lane. All the relationship with him and Lois Lane has been, took place the, between Man of Steel and Batman v Superman. The funniest one to me too is in this trailer, there's a shot of like the Superman memorial site. And it has this line, which is like a, a, a quote about Jesus, but they've put it on Superman, which is like, if you seek his memorial, look around you. And it's like, again, if this is like a standalone movie going in cold. If this, yeah, if this was like the DC animated universe where it's like the movies sort of like exist in their sure. own context yeah. or something. And you're doing a Justice League movie where like the world is without Superman and like this team is having to come together and prove themselves even though they are not a Kryptonian god. That's a good idea for a movie. Like that's, you can build a movie out of that and this trailer actually pitches that idea very well for a trailer. But again, it's the gaslighting of like, yeah. but I saw Batman v Superman, Ben Affleck saying all this stuff, he tried to kill him with a spear. <laughs> Kryptonian spear. Like, it's, it's so, like as a sequel, it's so mind boggling that the only way to enjoy it will probably be to just try to pretend Batman v Superman didn't happen. Yeah. The other part of the trailer that like, sort of like hurt me and like just hurt my eyes was there's just all the it's that very distinctive like dc movie like cg barf thing yes. they do of like because now there's all these and i actually like saw some comparison shots of there were shots from the older trailers that didn't have this like weird red cg bullshit everywhere that that is now in like what it looks like is going to be like the climactic scene of the movie is them fighting through this like like the world is being taken over by parademons and all that kind of stuff and now has all this like red fog and, and weird shit in it and just keeps on like like i can't i feel like 
one, it just looks bad and messy and convoluted. But it also is like, I feel like superhero movies have to move past this. Yes. Like Avengers 1 did it and did it really well. And, it, and, and like that was great. But it's like there have been so many superhero movies and we just, I can't do it. Like it was the worst part of Wonder Woman to me was that like that's what the last fight at Wonder Woman devolved into was like ridiculous CG stuff that felt like I'm not anchored in this world and in these characters anymore because the characters aren't there anymore. I'm watching like a video game cutscene from like the early, or like from the mid 2000s. And it's the, it's the one part of the trailer and from what I've heard the movie where Zack Snyder is still in the film is that they, they reshot pretty much everything other than his action scenes. And again, when we talk about Zack Snyder being distinctive, his sense of action is giant, mega, massive destruction. Like, yeah. above and beyond, there's this trend in superhero movies. In the DC movies in specific, there's this thing that came from Man of Steel and Zack Snyder, which is he likes to stage action as we're going to blow up cities. Yeah. Like, it's the Roland Emmerich kind of thing, right? And we thought that was really problematic in all these. I agree, it's the most problematic part of Wonder Woman is it's a really thoughtful movie until CG smash smash. Yeah. And like, you know, and it's just this thoughtless destruction. And again, it's the funniest part of Batman v Superman is Zack Snyder did not get why people don't like that. And so there's the line of like, don't worry, there's no one in those buildings. Yeah. And it's like, that's not the problem. Yeah. That's not the problem. I mean, it's, 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 it's part of the problem. It felt like a thing of like if you watch an old GI Joe cartoon, it's like every time the 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 Cobra planes blow up, you see the Cobra soldiers like get out with parachutes. It's like it actually <laughs> better than the, that. It reminds me of like in Dragon Ball Z, like the original early dubs, where there wouldn't even be the parachute, but like Master Roshi would point off and say, "Don't worry, I can see their shoots," even though you yeah. know that's not in the actual show. Yeah, it's like no, those people are dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Nappa blows up a plane, and it's yeah. like, "Don't worry, they had parachutes." Yeah, that's what it's like. And so that's clearly survived because that's the thing that's too expensive to reshoot. And that's still in the trailer. And I actually think it looks better than it has in the other trailers because it's more colorful. It's clearer. The CGI looks better. But it's still like it's Aquaman smashing through an entire like, you know, fucking tenement ghetto. And, I'll, and I'm also thinking like this is like gentrification in a really gross way. Because sure, it's always yeah. like the slums they're fighting in. Yeah. And it's just all of it like, yeah, I agree. Because I actually think like the character stuff... Jason Momoa's Aquaman seems cool to me. Sure. Yeah. I'm loving Ezra Miller's Flash. He seems awesome. I will look forward to that Ezra Miller Flash movie if it ever gets out of development hell. Because he seems like a good Flash. We Don't know, worry, Ron Howard's going to make it. We know Wonder Woman's awesome. Yeah. Ben Affleck seems really sad to be there, but that's, you know, whatever. Jeremy Irons gets to do the same jokes yeah, yeah. he made in Batman v Superman. It's great. And Jeremy Irons always puts in effort, so, yeah. you know, that's good. But, like, you know, there are things that I, I can tangibly look at in that trailer and say I'm looking forward to seeing that. But, yeah, like, the action stuff just... You know, and it's something... When I rewatch Superman the movie in this extended cut, and just reminded, like, yeah, this movie's vision of... Like, it had really amazing effects for the time, but its vision of Superman was he talks first. Yeah. And that's what makes him super heroic. Like, the whole montage is a series of him... Saving people, one, from very mundane situations, and two, when he does it, like, talking and not resorting to violence pretty much ever. Like, he only raises a fist against Lex Luthor once, and that's when Lex won't tell him where, like, this detonator is, you know? Yeah. And it's like, he doesn't know what to do. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, you can have the more bombastic action. I like that sometimes, like, in, you know, Civil War and all that, but, like... You know, the Civil War is actually, I think, a pretty good example. Before the superheroes start throwing punches in that movie, there's like two hours of talking. Right. And I think you actually kind of need that because they're human beings. Yeah. You know, so I don't know. I am so curious to see this movie. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we do have to see it, huh? You didn't watch Suicide Squad. No, I didn't. So you have to see this one. I'm not doing this alone. <laughs> It has to be better than that. Like, I'm just thinking, like, they have put so much time and money into basically remaking the movie after they made it. It has to be. But does it? Like, that also sounds like the recipe for a terrible fucking movie, doesn't it? I don't know. I just, I don't know. I, uh, fuck. This thing. Okay, talking about a movie that has not been reshot to death and seems like the, the, the you know, it is actually a shining beacon of a blockbuster that did not get remade five times. Yeah. Star Wars The Last Jedi. Yeah. Another trailer. That was a really good movie trailer. Fucking, it's just every time, because this is only the second trailer we've gotten, and it, it, every time we're getting more from this movie, I'm just like, I the thing I've always needed, I wanted when you started doing this, like, you could take my expanded universe and all this shit, Disney, I just need more Mark Hamill as Luke Skywalker, and you fucking made me watch a whole movie where you didn't do it, 
And now I'm finally getting, finally fucking getting the movie where they're fucking doing it. And holy shit, he looks so good. And everything around Everything him, right? looks great. Yeah, it's a fantastic trailer. No, but the Mark Hamill of it, like... Because <sighs> this is not Mark Hamill of 1983 playing Luke Skywalker. This is the Mark Hamill who has spent 30 years honing one of the greatest voices in Hollywood history. Yes, exactly. Which he did not have in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. When he played Luke Skywalker. The first. He's great in those movies, but he doesn't have the voice. Yeah, I think like people if you have not been keeping up with his, his voice acting career are going to be shocked by how honed that man is at this point. Like, he has had an illustrious acting career. It just happens that most of it has not been on screen. And, uh, I mean, are you also digging the, like, kind of darker vibe from Luke in this? Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's just, I love it. It looks good. I like the, the the stuff with, like, Kylo Ren looks good because he was my favorite character from the yeah, yeah. from Episode 7. Just, oh, I like, love it. felt like he had the most interesting story. It feels like... It feels like they have a good direction for that character in this movie. It's it's interesting because, you know, The Force Awakens was, again, very self-consciously very tied to, like, Episode Four and the original trilogy. Yeah. And that it was getting us started on a new foot by kind of revisiting the past. Which I think is a valid way to do it, but it does mean it's not going to be at, like, the most exciting Star Wars thing ever. Yeah. I just thought it was a very good, solid movie. And then Rogue One was mostly, again, just kind of... But then it wasn't even that good a movie and fan service and all this stuff. Last Jedi doesn't look like that to me. Last yeah. Jedi, everything we've seen from it looks like this is not rehashing Star Wars. This is doing something new with Star Wars. Maybe the movie won't be that, but that's what I see in the trailers. That's what I've heard from people who've like seen the script and stuff. And like, there's just because all this stuff with like um, Kylo Ren, it seems like they're they're not doing like a rehash of the Darth Vader arc. Yeah. It looks like he's like taking off the mask, destroying it, and like pushing himself in some new dark direction and that seems fascinating to me yeah, it's just it, it's something that you we got hints of it in the last trailer and i think this one sort of like more cements this feeling i'm getting from this movie that it feels like they are like ryan johnson and that team are taking a lot of like the more interesting ideas from the the old like star wars expanded universe of of stuff that is in the movies but is not you was never really like the the focus of the movies of that kind of like blurring the lines between good and bad in Star Wars and like what does it mean to be on the light side of the force versus the dark side of the force what are those things what is the Jedi what are the Sith like what are these like institutions are they as morally like sound as we take them to be and again I think that's something that like people really underestimate the original trilogy in particular and how it blurs those lines and also like the prequel trilogy has a lot of good stuff there but the expanded universe did a lot of stuff that really focused in on those questions and this movie feels like particularly Luke's role exists there to like complicate a lot of the assumptions like the very basic assumptions that people make about the star wars universe that are wrong and this movie looks like they're kind of diving into those ideas yeah and i know you know i kind of felt caught with my pants down on this on rogue one where i talked so much about how the trailers looked so visually cool and that amounted to not much in the actual movie mostly because right. nothing in the trailers was in the film yeah remember <laughs> that like, great shot of the main character like turning around as like the lights are coming on in her imperial suit that's like that's a great shot. Look at this like awesome heist movie this is going to be that she has to infiltrate the like the empire to get these plans. This is like the shot's not in the movie. Also is not like indicates nothing about the plot of that movie. But that said, the last Jedi trailers have been visually stunning more yeah. so than Rogue One to me. And like I even did a tweet where I I was just took like four frame grabs of shots I found truly amazing. And one of the things that's interesting to me is that I can already, and part of this is we've seen Force Awakens and we know the characters, but all the shots I found amazing in this movie, I can more easily tie to character and they feel like they have substance even before we see the movie. Like there's that shot of, there's those shots of Rey like training with the lightsaber yeah. and there's one that does this low angle on her with like sun breaking through the clouds and it looks like if like Terrence Malick shot a Star Wars movie and I love it. Or there's that really amazing shot of like Kylo Ren in the helmet against this like red background yeah. which looks like, the looks like like, if the trailer for uh, Revenge of the Jedi, as it was called in that poster, was the actual movie, yeah. Revenge of the Jedi, or something like that. Like, And there's just a bunch of shots in this trailer that are, I thought, truly visually stunning. And, you know, Ryan Johnson is, as much as anyone working on big movies these days, a actual proven quantity. Like, he yeah. has made great movies. He has directed amazing television like Breaking Bad. Like, he has the chops so part of me just also trusts this more. Also, the movie hasn't gone through like seven rounds of reshoots. Yeah. It, it is like reassuring to have one of these big budget movies, either like for like like DC and Star Wars and stuff. It just feels like every movie has all these ridiculous behind the scenes issues. And like The Last Jedi, just like 
chugged right along. It's also like finished filming, like like finishing post production, and like not a peep out of it. I think it was like three or four weeks ago. Ryan Johnson had a tweet where someone asked him like, "Where are you in like making Last Jedi?" He said, "We're actually done. <laughs> I'm not working on it. It's picture locked." That's amazing, like because yeah. that's months ahead of like like I think even the Force Awakens, which had a pretty smooth production, you know, they were still working on it a few weeks out from release. Like that right. just tends to happen, so that's kind of cool. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, like this and Thor Ragnarok also has seemed really smooth, and people are also starting to see Thor Ragnarok and loving it. So good, yeah. Those are the two movies I'm most excited for probably this this Christmas, at least in terms of big, you know, yeah, Hollywood you stuff. Dude, that that Mark Hamill with that beard and just Jesus. that. Oh man. And I also like, and I love the character of Ray, and I feel like that's going to be a really interesting dynamic having them together. Yeah, you know, I love that they're emphasizing that in the trailers. And yeah, we're getting Mark Hamill as Luke Skywalker in the year twenty seventeen, and that's going to be great. Yes, I also like if if I I'm going to say this now: if old Luke Skywalker, voiced by Mark Hamill, is playable in Star Wars Battlefront two at some point in DLC, I will buy that game when it is for on sale for three dollars in two weeks after it comes out. <laughs> All right, speaking of video games, one last piece of news before we move on to Blade Runner is um, we had another, like, video game industry departure that I find really interesting. Yeah. Which is Mike Laidlaw, who was the creative director of the Dragon Age series, uh, has left Bioware. And we know Dragon Age 4 is in production. The Austin studio is working on that. Uh, Like, it's an open secret. They haven't announced it yet. Yeah. Um, if you read Jason Schreer's Blood, Sweat, and Pixels book, which we have sung the praises on, yes. Mike Laidlaw is a very interesting character in the production of those games because he is kind of, for a giant game like that, as close as you get to like the authorial voice. Right. He really was the, the driving force behind making the Dragon Age games. And you know, his, his exit statement was not, you know, like didn't sound sad or any like like uh, you know, like there was a horrible falling out. There might have been, we don't know, but it also wasn't like super conciliatory. So it's hard to read those tea leaves, but um, you know it's it's interesting and it's hard not to think of like, well they 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 fucked up the last series at Bioware with this game's release. Right. For reference, I just wanted to note this: Mass Effect Andromeda today, October fifteenth, you can buy it for nine ninety nine new on Amazon only Fuck. as an add on item for Prime members. Yeah, like so sad horn sound on that. I mean, video games go on sale faster these days than they used to, anyways. But that's fucking crazy i mean mass effect andromeda was a bomb yeah in every sense of the word and i hope the next dragon age won't be that and there are still all the other people there and it could be great yeah it's just a little sad to see that guy go yeah like i remember like if people have not played dragon age origins the original dragon age game that's a fucking amazing rpg and you know he was a huge part of, of that game and you know like i have mixed feelings about dragon age inquisition but i enjoyed that game quite a bit and i i well, I, I skipped over Dragon Age 2 for understandable reasons. I still, res- like, especially reading Blood, Sweat, and Pixels made me respect that team for what they managed to do. Because I know there are, like, there are people that love Dragon Age 2, like, even with its flaws. But yeah, like, I think the Dragon Age franchise is a really, really interesting sort of, like, modern throwback to that older era of, like, you know, early, late 90s, early 2000s, like, computer RPGs. Yeah. And, and they're really cool. I just, you know, I think, I think the next few years are going to be really interesting tests for Bioware. Yeah, because if Anthem is great, that's awesome. If Dragon Age Four is great, that's even better, because that will prove they can continue going. But you know, they broke off and did this Andromeda game, and Mass Effect is now very much dead and buried, and has a stake through it. Yeah, they're going to have to wait a while before they bring Mass Effect back. So you know, they kind of are going to have to push forward into new territory. And Anthem is the real test because that's the same team that did Mass Effect. Yeah, Dragon Age Four will be the real test for that series. It's just, you know, I, I wonder if Bioware is going through a, a kind of Bungie-esque shift. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I have some, like, reasonably high hopes for a Dragon Age 4 that I think, like, the especially, again, like, after reading Blood, Sweat, and Pixels and getting that, that like, much needed and rarely offered, like, peek behind the curtains on how those games are made. Yeah. And, like, understanding a lot of the issues that that, game, that, that team ran into, particularly, like... Stuff like rumors that I had heard for a while, but had never seen like sort of clarified as much in that, as in that book of the issues they ran into using the Frostbite engine. That seems like that was a fucking hell for that development team. That hopefully, you know, moving past a lot of the sort of like growing pains that a lot of studios had in moving to this generation um, and moving to different, you know, engines and stuff like that. 
hopefully like having those problems out of the way and not having to make a fucking Dragon Age Inquisition for Xbox 360 and PS3. Because remember, they fucking somehow they fucking did that. Um, yeah, I think there's a good chance that Dragon Age 4 will be good. I, oh, like, totally, I think the but... problems like with Mass Effect Andromeda hopefully were like with that specific production. Yes. Uh, all right, so that's the news. That's the stuff. This has been a long one so far, but we still have a fascinating topic to get into, and that yes. is Blade Runner 2049. Yes, so titled for the number of minutes in the running length of the movie. Okay, well, Sean, let's start there. Uh, spoilers from here on out for Blade Runner 2049. Yeah. I, I take, did you have a problem with the length of the movie? It's just too long. Like, okay. I know we talked about um, two weeks ago when we did our Blade Runner thing that it's like, you know, Blade Runner 1 could, you could, you could... Like I said there, if I had not recently watched that movie, you could convince me that that Blade Runner one was three hours long. With like Blade Runner 2049, you could convince me that movie's like four hours long. I think okay. there's just like too much fat. There's too much. I think, that it, and part of it is is like really my issues with it like are almost entirely contained in the screenplay. Um, I think there's like a lot of the dialogue to me is kind of clunky. And there's just like, there's just too much dialogue. There's too much of characters standing around and talking about things that's just like, we don't need this much of this. Like, if you you cut a lot of this out and streamline this, the stuff that is amazing about this movie to me would have shined so much harder if they relied on it more and didn't have as much of like characters talking about things all yeah. the time. I, you know, I, and I, I I said I love this movie. Um, I don't think it's perfect, and I can identify some issues with it. And they're probably going to be in the exact same areas you have issues yeah. with it. Like. Yeah, it's probably. Uh, I think this is going to be one of our conversations where it's like we both have the, the same things we love and the same things we hate. It's just like the degrees of both of them. Sure, and and you know I do think it's a better movie than it is a script, and ultimately to me, like where my priorities lie in cinema, this has all the good stuff and the things I love most, and so it it works for me completely. But there are, I agree, I, you know, and I, I did not mind the length at all, and I've seen it twice now. I saw it once in a regular theater and once on IMAX, because the IMAX version is slightly different, and I can talk about that, it's kind of interesting. But, um, you know, both times, like, I felt the length more the second time, because I knew it was coming. Right. Um, but I didn't mind it either time, and I think it's just, it's such a good piece of filmmaking, and it is so well acted, and the atmosphere is so thick, that, like, you just kind of melt into it, and I did not mind the runtime either time. That said, like, if I am, like, taking myself out of it and critiquing the script, there are things where, like, for instance, I'll give a good example, is there's this, uh, you know, th there is a, like, mystery in this movie, and there's multiple steps the, the main character played by Ryan Gosling has to go on, and one of those is one of the kind of, because I think of this movie as kind of, kind of like the original Blade Runner, frankly, is it's a series of, like, episodes and set pieces, sure, and each one kind of almost plays out at best as, like, a short film almost, and I think the original Blade Runner very much has that quality, where scenes take on this kind of, they are movies within a movie, and this one has that too, and one of those is, where Kay is going out to this orphanage yeah, uh, out in like the out outskirts of LA. And I love some things in that sequence so much. The like the approach out to LA, that's some amazing visuals. Or out of LA is some yeah. amazing visuals. I think what happens when he lands, some interesting stuff happens. And then there's one sequence in particular, which is like the most, this in the Las Vegas stuff is like the most Tarkovsky-esque stuff in the movie. There's a lot of Andre Tarkovsky in this movie, is where... K is like searching around after he has failed to get the information he wanted and he realizes this is the place from his memory and he is going to try to find the little wooden horse and he finds it and pulls it out and everything and that sequence is like super long but I love it because it's it's silent other than the music and it's just Ryan Gosling going and, and looking for this thing that he knows is going to utterly change his life and outlook if he finds it and I think it's a stupendous piece of filmmaking. I think the scripting necessary to get us to that piece of filmmaking is undeniably kind of clunky. Yeah. Because you have to have, like, the clue that gets him there. And when he gets there, there's kind of yet another piece of the subculture we're seeing. And I think, again, on a filmmaking level, it's realized phenomenally in terms of this whole, you know, like, orphanage of, like, child slaves and stuff that's interesting. But it does feel on a writing level kind of labored for him to get there and talk to this guy. And this guy gives him this clue and stuff when really what you need is him getting, you know, I think you could have found a simpler reason in the script and a more pared down reason for him to get there and have that revelation. Yeah. Because I do think it's a phenomenal moment when that happens. But I would agree that, like, there are labored plot mechanics to get us there. It, part of what it reminded me of is if you've ever seen the, like, ridiculous, super long director's cut of Apocalypse Now, that's just, like, they shot a lot of footage for that movie that are like a lot of these scenes and sequences that on their own are fantastic because of course they are, it's, you know, Apocalypse Now, but like don't, 
like do a lot to contribute to the main plot and just like slow the movie down to a fucking crawling pace and it's just like in the original theatrical cut of that movie they cut all that stuff out and it's like that's a bad version of that movie it's like you don't need all these detours all the time and i think there is some of that stuff of like with later in 2049 it would be harder to cut some of that stuff because like you do like because there are kernels of like really important main plot things that happen in that sequence where he goes to the orphanage but it's like like you said it's like there's all these steps that need to happen to get there that just feels like you don't need all of this like it's it's good stuff on its own but in the context of the whole like that's because it's, it's that kind of thing of like i agree that each scene is fantastic on its own but it almost has that like my issue with a lot of quentin tarantino movies of like these scenes stand really well on their own but when you put them all together to me they like they they don't tell a larger story that is like greater than the sum of its parts kind of thing and it's interesting time. because blade runner 2049 has a like one of the the comparisons i made when i first saw the movie is it reminded me a lot of the feelings i had with like twin peaks the return in that it is at once way more of a sequel than i thought it was going to sure, be sure yeah like it, it 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 relates to things from the original film more than i thought it would and that's interesting but it also is like it is its own thing like it's its own movie it has a lot of stylistic things it borrows and builds on from blade runner but it fe you know it has its own i think perspective on this world and i think it has its own aesthetic you know reason to be and all of that and that's one of the things i love about it is that it does feel like its own evolved thing even as it connects to the original more than i thought um but within that like i think it is super interesting to see where it continues from Blade Runner and where it does its own thing like it, it is a much bigger movie and it's, oh, yes. it's a longer movie it goes to more places it has a bigger story and I think that's fine I think that's an interesting way to take it because you can't actually get much more intimate than the original Blade Runner I don't yeah. think you could go smaller than that no. um, yeah. but like within that they still have I think the general sense of pace from the original Blade Runner and they still also know that like the plot is still secondary to character building, atmosphere, all these other things. Or I, here's the thing: I don't know if the script knows that. Yeah. Dennis Villeneuve yeah. absolutely knows that. And so there's a lot of stuff in this movie where, like, I bet you could film this script and make it like a two-hour movie. But that's not Blade Runner then. Sure. And so he filmed it as a as Blade Runner to me, and it, that means longer, more long. And you have some scenes that, like, you know, I think maybe the best scene in the movie in terms of, I think, what it says about the film and its themes is probably the, the threesome scene with the AI lady and the, the woman playing Mackenzie Davis and Ryan yeah. Gosling. It has nothing to do with the plot. I mean, I guess there is that little thing where she plants the tracker on him. But it is mostly, it's kind of like multiple scenes in the original Blade Runner where we're not advancing, like, the hunt for the androids but we are furthering what this world means and says. And there is sometimes a push and pull, I think, between where the movie's heart is and where the plot might want to push it. Yeah. Because I actually do ultimately like the story this movie tells a whole hell of a lot, and I think it gets to some really powerful emotional places at the end. I would agree that I think you could tell that story in a more pared-down fashion. Yeah, because to me, it's... Because it, it does, it feels like the Dennis Villeneuve sort of has this like really good sense of like what he can borrow and take from the original Blade Runner that like suits his talents as a filmmaker and uses that really well. But he's also like applying those things to a script that like one of the things I was really kind of shocked by with the movie is that it's an epic. Like it's 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 a hero's journey plot. Like. Yes beat to beat like it's one of the most like hero's journeys plots i've seen in a while and that was something i was like i still haven't fully processed how i feel about that because i only saw the movie the one time so and like, i like that but but we can talk about it yeah but like it feels something like it, it felt in the moment and it like still feels to me like really antithetical in a lot of ways to what blade runner is and like kind of what cyberpunk is like it's directly antithetical to film noir and and, and blade runner is sort of like a pseudo film noir movie but like it's something that is like there's something weird about the idea of like you doing this sort of like very hero's journey to plot line to a like a movie like this with like the kinds of aesthetic sensibilities that it has because a hero's journey plot line has like these steps that it needs to follow to sort of like get your main character to the place he needs to be at the end of the movie in a way that like a Blade Runner one didn't need to have like because Deckard's not a hero like Deckard's barely even a fucking protagonist right of that movie. And so that like the, that blend for me is part of where that kind of starts to break down for me of, of like there's so much like there has to be put a certain degree of significance to the main plot to make this kind of like structural plot work 
that does not necessarily blend well with the kind of like the visual filmmaking sensibilities that that Denis Villeneuve shows off in this movie. And I, I agree and disagree with parts of that because while I do think the script could be pared down in areas, I do love the overall scope of it. Mm-hmm. I do love that it is an epic and it has this hero's journey quality to it because I think, I mean, one, I think it's just done very well and I think this is a movie where so much of the substance does lie in the style and I think it finds the things that are meaningful in that story and I think on a stylistic level especially gets all that in there even more than I think it is on the page. But I also think like I really do love the idea that if you're going to make a sequel to Blade Runner and it has to be a different kind of thing, I think choice one that works in this movie for me is that the main character is a replicant. I think that's kind of where you have to go with it. And I think then... Because you're with the replicant, the questions being asked have so much more immediacy and significance, and everything that happens is a little more heightened than when you're at the detach of Deckard, and he is a guy who is, again, I don't want to hear the comments, ostensibly human, for 116 of the 117 minutes of Blade Runner. Blah, blah, blah. Right. But anyway, and so I think it's really interesting to, you know, uh, the other thing people have compared this to more than just like the hero's journey is archetypally it has elements of like fairy tale to it because it's also kind of a Pinocchio story. It's the guy sure, who, yeah. it's the it's the person who is ostensibly fake and realizes he is real. And I think, you know, one of the things I thought of a lot watching this is The Godfather 2, sure. which is a movie that is, and I don't mean like tonally or any of these right. things, but just that. The Godfather 2, if you, I know The Godfather is a long movie. It's three hours. The Godfather 2 is like another 20 or 30 minutes over that, but feels even longer. The Godfather 2 feels like a five-hour movie. And I don't say that as a criticism, but it covers so much ground. And it takes like the thematic basics of Godfather and makes them so much bigger and, and goes in so much different, more thematic directions with it. I think it's one of the reasons why that movie is beloved. I also think it's one of the reasons, to me, I find that movie a little more laborious than the original Godfather. Um, but with Blade Runner 2049, I think it takes a similar principle in taking a lot of the ideas that are fundamental kernels to Blade Runner and growing from those, to me, in very organic ways. And, and some of those are, like this has, and I think it's one of the things the length and the epic quality allows this film is that even if th- there are moments where the story might feel like, you know, the steps to get us places are meandering, it allows Dennis Villeneuve and the actors and the characters to breathe and like develop in interesting ways because there's so many different thematic facets he's touching on um you know i think some of the obvious ones obviously being not just what you know what does it mean to be a replicant in this world and what does reality mean when you are a constructed being which is this question through the whole movie but one of the things it does interestingly to me is that almost everyone we see in the movie is a replicant especially if you have the belief that deckard is a replicant there's other than robin wright there are no significant characters in the film that are not like well, what if what if Robin Wright's character is actually replicant too? I'm sure someone's I don't, pro- someone must have written like oh, 500 pages. I've already that. seen a, a theory about how the entire movie is a dream by the girl at the end, and yes, I yeah, said that stupid. Well. But anyway, like you know, uh, what I was saying is that because you're on this level of like everything in this movie has these layers of it's about replication. And it's about, you know, so you have Ryan Gosling, who is a replication, and his girlfriend is an AI lady who is a replication of a replication. And, you know, you have all the stuff in Vegas where you have this whole, like, you know, hierarchy built on having your Elvis replications and things like that. And everything is fake and constructed, and yet do we find meaning in that? And, and so there's these, all these parallel thematic lines that I think come together really beautifully. Uh, and I think more than anything, the like plot to me is this skeleton on which they're able to build all these other things because it allows for a scope and depth of vision that I really enjoy. But I also think it it pushes the movie to ask, the, allows the movie to ask the big questions. And it's a weird thing where I think if you told me two years ago that the plot of this would be about Deckard and Rachel's baby, uh-huh. I would say that's stupid. On the page, that sounds stupid to me. I think it's all in the execution. And again, to me... It's so much less in how Denis Villeneuve shoots it and chooses to emphasize things. It's so much less about that baby and where did they go and the big mystery of it than we're watching, you know, Agent K, the the Ryan Gosling character, reacting to this life-shaking thing he's going through over the course of the movie. And that's where the weight is placed. And that's where I feel the epicness of it. And... I think that's interesting and I do think you could have done a version of this movie where you shoot it and it's much more about like the intricacies of like what that means for humanity and the bigger picture questions and stuff and I don't think that would work but I don't think that's what's emphasized in the execution of this. 
So yeah. that's a long rambling way to connect some of my disparate thoughts on like the scope of the film. Yeah. But the, the, like, like, cause let's talk about that kind of like core plot thing of the, the like Christ child esque sort of main conceit, because if you had told me that that was the main plot of this movie two years ago, I would have said it was stupid and I still don't like it, like, having watched the movie. I think, like, the I think that Dennis Villeneuve does find, like, ways to tell an interesting story in there, but I still don't like that. I, like, I, I think, and there's something, there's just a weird disconnect for me of, there's, of, like, just, that's, it's such a loaded symbol to use one, and then also it's just, like, a, there's kind of, like, a practical level of, like, what the fuck does that even mean for replicants to reproduce on any, like, any, like, you know, I don't want to like, you know, say it's like, oh, it's a plot hole or something. That's not what I'm saying. But there was just a, it, it's when that's that, that concept of you have two artificial like robots, basically, that somehow reproduce and create a child. Like there are so many that then is able to grow and change and do all that stuff is so one like counter to what I understood the replicants to be for having seen Blade Runner 1 and also just like doesn't make any sense that it makes it hard for me to get invested into that idea thematically if i can't sort of like file away the sort of like textual like implications of like okay that's what that is that's what that means for a replicant to reproduce is this thing because it's like that shit don't make any sense but then also i think it's just like the 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 idea of that being the main plot of that being like the sort of like main motive just didn't really work for me. It's kind of hard for me to sort of like precisely think of and like explain why I think I'd need to have to like watch the movie again to get a better reason for it. But it was something that like, because I also think it like, it plays the card so hard of like, well, of course that means that you're supposed to then think that K is going to be the kid. But then obviously because you're supposed to think that K is supposed to be the kid, he's not the kid. And like those, that like, that core mechanic of the plot is so brazenly obvious from like the, the core conceit that they introduce like 15 minutes in that it helps make the plot like feel more laborious than it actually is. If but, that makes but, any sense. No, I totally understand yeah. that. Um, and you know, it's not like my experience with the movie, but I do totally understand yeah. that. And I think, you know, I can talk about why it works for me is again, it's because of the point of view of the movie. And again, talking about style being substance for me. Um, and I guess within style, I'm including a lot of the aesthetics and everything. Right. And, and also Ryan Gosling's performance, because I think it's one of the best performances Ryan Gosling's ever given. And I think he's an amazing actor. Um, in fact, if you want to see a movie where I think he gives a very similar performance in a weirdly similar story, uh, the, the 2011 movie Drive is actually a great precedent for his work in this. But um, what I was going to say is that I think it's, again, because of that POV and we're following him through it, yes, it is obvious that we, we are supposed to think he is and that then we're supposed to think he's not. But I think it's because he's following on that journey too. And I think... Again, with all the different things that are... Like, so many of the themes of this movie, it never even draws attention to. They're just parts of the atmosphere and the aesthetics. And, you know, even the stuff with his AI girlfriend, which is a much larger part of the plot, that doesn't, like... I don't think that gets labored on or, or added into the main plot mixture in ways that could have felt very hackneyed to me as well. And so you're watching this character who is living in this world of replication... And everything in his life is fake and he has nothing to grasp onto. And whether the plot conceit makes complete sense to me or not, there is this spark that happens with him in that, oh my God, what if these things I, I have always been told and felt were fake has some layer of reality to it? And I think where Dennis Villeneuve, Roger Deakins, and Ryan Gosling, and Hans Zimmer, Benjamin Walfish, the composers, like take that journey with him, like, you know, the scene... Where, like I said, where he finds the horse for the first time, or when he visits the Dream Maker, which is just an amazing sequence, and and I think where Ryan Gosling takes that at the end of this, like shaking apart, or all the stuff when he's out in Las Vegas, and where these things take, and how his motivations subtly shift over the course of the film from, you know, I've been told to go do a job to I am having an existential crisis, and then the last act of the movie, which is taking that rug out from under him. And it's a rug we knew was going to be taken out, but it still, to me, had so much impact and power because of how he plays that, how it's introduced in this, like, you know, we're, we're always on the outskirts of whatever the bigger social movement is in Blade Runner 1 and 2 here. And we get that, too, with, like, the android revolution and the sense of this is a dream we all share. And then the last act of the movie being him having to face the existential question, all right, I'm not what I, you know, I'm not real in that sense. But all those things I felt were real, what do I do with them now? 
And I think where it goes with that is absolutely stunning and beautiful um, in in the the last couple of sequences. So, yeah, it's it, again when I it, I really do think of the plot as this skeleton on which they build all these other more interesting thematic conceits. And you know, and even where they bring it with Deckard, like I think one of my favorite sequences in the movie is Deckard and Wallace, the Jared Leto character. Um, right. Wallace only has two scenes in the movie, which is interesting to me, and and. Um, it means Jared Leto is good and not annoying because they don't over... Right. I don't know. Um, uh, Jared Leto is more annoying as a person than an actor. I actually don't mind him as an actor, I should say. But anyway, like this, the second scene with Wallace is the scene with Deckard. And it's the whole thing about Rachel and he can, you know... It, and you get a lot of all of Wallace's motivations for this. But again, it's ultimately centered on Deckard like reckoning with this thing in his life where there's this ambiguity about whether he is real or not, which I think is probably a good acknowledgement of the 30 years of fan debate on that. Sure, yeah. And whether, you know, because Rachel was a replicant, whether that was real or not, they made this child, you know, what was that? And Harrison Ford has this line in that sequence where, you know, Wallace is trying to push all these pressure points and he just says, I know what's real. And all he means by that is I know when it feels real and it has meaning to me. And that's to me like the thesis of the entire movie and what keeps coming up in these different, you know, and I, th and I think the movie has different critiques too. Like I don't think you're supposed to see the thing with the AI girlfriend as like this beautiful romance going on. Right. I actually think it's a really interesting thematic counterpoint to Rachel in the original film. And consistently those ideas of characters through this plot having to grapple with what is and isn't real and what feels real and meaningful to them um, is interesting. And I also, this is one of the things I said after my first viewing of the movie is there's a million metatextual things, I think, going on in this film as well, in terms of where it's in conversation with Blade Runner, where it's in conversation with the cultural conversation of Blade Runner, and even things like how the film uses digital photography and the entire idea of reality again, and or what is organic and what isn't. I think there's a lot of metatextual conversations in the movie, too. But I guess, yeah, I, and I guess what I can say also is I know I keep going off on, like, tangents about this. It's because it's a movie that is, while it has this plot structure that is actually, you know, you could say much more concrete than the original Blade Runner in terms of point A to B. Um, it is such a big, open, beautiful, artistic canvas to me. I just, I watch it, and like any good art film, it, it, it prompts a thousand different free associations. And I think it's a really beautiful canvas for that. But And I guess for me, my main issue with that is that like I can enjoy that when it is that more like focused experience, but when you are grafting that onto a like sort of like larger structure that is not was not and is not designed to support that kind of storytelling to me it just like it doesn't jive and it does and it makes it like hard for those things to culminate and so it's like things where again it's that effect of like those individual scenes I like enjoy on their own but together like they don't signify that much to me like and I think like it does have these sort of core themes that we're identifying but are also like the kinds of core themes that have, of like, uh, am I real? Am I not real? Like, is artificial life life or is only organic life life? Is the the themes that all these things have that like, to me, the fact that like not having those things culminate together into like this really st strong core like punch, which is like what Blade Runner one does for me so well. That that's kind of like where I kind of start getting zoning out or getting bored because of the length of the movie. Sure, and again, I can see that, but I'll you know I'll say. When I talk about the style and the substance coming together, it's moments like the end of the movie, which I think packs a really powerful punch by, by partially, it's such like that there's almost a dialogue in like the last half hour of the movie, which I think is notable. But like, you know, when it's Ryan Gosling lying in the snow, having gotten Decker to this place and journey done and like feeling the snow on his hand and echoing things in this movie and the previous movie and all of that, like, yes, the, the questions that have been asked on this journey are not new questions, but I feel like it is realized in a really tremendously beautiful way. And when he's lying there, you know, feeling the snow on his hand, I had a completely different reaction to it over the two viewings, like where I was mm -hmm. moved both times. But the second time it was like, you know, really like, I think crystallizing in my mind, you know, this guy in death, it's 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 a visual version of the tears in the rain sequence like sure. completely that's completely how i read it the second time through was you know him lying there dying is this realization of like 
because there's that there's also I mean there's a bunch of associations here like the line his la- the last line I think in the whole movie is he says the best memories are hers as he beckons Deckard to go inside yeah and this recognition that like you know it's kind of a, a lament in that okay the things I valued most in my memory weren't mine and I I value you Deckard that I, you are my father figure in some sense because I had memories of your child go on in but then it's this the best memories are hers and then lying and just in that exquisite experience of being in the environment and feeling things and reaching out towards things he has had life and he has felt meaning and and it's something that it's almost hard to put into words and i'll say this my little brother thomas um who has watched blade runner twice with me and the first time he was a kid and he shouldn't have watched blade runner probably and he fell asleep the second time more recently he found it really like intellectually interesting but it left him very cold which i understand blade sure, runner yeah. will do that to you he was crying at the end of this movie. Like that huh. sequence in the snow. And I, I understand. And he couldn't tell me exactly why. Other than like that was just really beautiful. Because I think there is a like aesthetic cumulative weight to what happens to this character over the course of the film. But you know just, like. It's, what's funny to me is that I have like like Blade. And like to be fair I've seen Blade Runner 1 multiple times. So like yeah. I've already sort of processed it. But like that most recent time I rewatched Blade Runner. Like that like it almost moved me to tears. And this, the ending of this movie left me feeling very cold. Of like, I felt like, because I, I think there is something about like weird that this movie does with like, like of like both having like this like oh like K is a real boy too, but also kind of not of like also kind of like no, but like actually that yeah, like her memories are the real memories. She's your actual like daughter. Like like she's the actual like Christ child she's the actual important one like I actually am not that important that's why I'm not even going to tell you that I'm going to die because that's not even important and there's something kind of almost mismatched to me in that of like it's almost like the opposite of Rucker Hour and Blade Runner 1 where for him like for that character it was Roy Batty it's all about like I'm alive and I need you people to fucking see this that I'm alive that me I am important I am not just a cog and machine. I am not just a worker. I'm not just one of the thousands, millions of fuckers you put out there to do your work for you and you don't listen to me. I'm not that. Pay attention to me. I'm going to gouge your eyes out, God, because I need to be like seen and I need to be reckoned with that these are my memories and this is my life. And Kay doesn't have any of that and it feels like he just dies as another cog in the machine, but the movie doesn't sort of like present that as being tragic or regretful in any way. But I don't think that's what this movie is about. I think that's what Blade Runner 1 is about, and sure. I think the POV of it being a human seeing all these things is why Blade Runner 1 has to be about that. Blade Runner 2 is about a guy having to prove that to himself. Because before you can actualize any of that to the world, and I think this is one of the interesting ideas in the movie, and you know, it touches on some ideas about, like with through the Wallace character, about you know slave labor and... The need for that to like the how societies are built on that and that we're at like the lowest rung in this movie because everyone is building on this foundation and how utterly fucking dehumanizing that idea is for k it's i mean he starts this movie dead inside and, and again it's one of the things i thought of with drive because drive is also a movie about a guy it's not a sci-fi movie but it's about a guy who is metaphorically just completely like he is an auton you know he is like he just exists to be in the world and then he comes to an emotional awakening and it is an internal thing that matters to him. And I think Blade Runner 2049, weirdly because it is such a bigger movie with a larger canvas it's painting on, I think is a more internalized film than Blade Runner 1. I don't think it's about the external as much. I think it is about this emotional awakening this character has. And, you know, in that last moment, why is he doing this for Deckard? Who is it? Deckard says, you know, who are you to me? All these things. For Kay, the answers to all that question is, I needed something that gave me meaning and this is something I could do that meant something to to me, to the world, to, to you. And now I feel alive in this moment. And all of that goes unsaid, but I feel it very powerfully. And I actually think it's an interesting counterpoint to the anger of Roy Batty, who couldn't be the protagonist of his own movie because he's, he is too much of fire, you know? Is, you know Roy Batty's arc is, is more of what he was at the beginning, you know? And Kay's arc is is really, really transformative. And I think that's an interesting counterpoint to, to what Blade Runner 1 presents. But I think, like, there's something about that that is at odds with the... Like, not just, like, the spirit of Blade Runner, but, like, the spirit of, of cyberpunk for me. Of, like, I think there's a, like, lack of a... 
stronger sort of like political backbone or something to Blade Runner 2049 that is present in that like in that ending and then also like the weird like the really strange way they do that kind of like pseudo replicant rebellion thing that is like sort of brewing in the background but you don't know much about you don't spend much time with that's also one of the areas where you get some of the more like face palmy kind of dialogue moments where the dialogue is very on the nose where the the one woman the the sex worker says uh we're more human than human where she like just says that it's like you can't you don't no don't say that line i i took that as a very self-aware like tongue-in-cheek thing i don't know i think there's I something mean, about the way it was framed to me that didn't feel okay. that way to me it's just like because it's also like there's a lot of particularly at the beginning of the movie with the the cop dialogue like there's just it, like in the Robin Wright character, like there's like a lot of lines in this movie just, just are like a very like on the nose sort of cliche genre lines that felt weird to me that like that that they would even be in the movie that felt like this is something you should have like sanded over a little bit and like kind of personalized a bit more. Um, but like I think anyways, back to the sort of the main point, there is something missing to me in the movie of like you don't. I feel like you don't experience that kind of like the slums. You don't experience that kind of like lower class oppression in a way that feels odd to me. And it's one of those things of like is also present in them borrowing so much of the basic setting of Blade Runner 1, which was a setting constructed um, partially on the back of like specific globalist anxieties of like the early 80s of Asian countries like Japan and China specifically taking over american culture and like 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 the china becoming fully settled in its communist government and having like this big population boom and japan beginning like beginning its ep economic boom of the 80s there were specific economic and social anxieties in america at the time that create that landscape of oh we're like american culture is completely subsumed in this like really intense asian fusion culture that has totally taken over la and you know, white people are basically a minority in sections of that movie. And there are lots of Asian actors all over the place. And in Blade Runner 2049, it's like all white people. It's, it's all, and it's, it's that exact same setting, but it doesn't actually, it doesn't feel like that setting has been updated for like the sorts of anxieties that exist in, in like American culture in 2017. It is still sort of continuing that vector like projecting from 1982's Blade Runner of like how what does that future look like even further instead of sort of recreating that future in a more modern image and and not sort of like getting that experience of like of you know Deckard or Kay or whoever like in the city and like sitting down and like eating ramen or whatever it is like it doesn't have to be the exact same scenes obviously of Blade Runner 1 but something of that effect that gives you this broader sense of what is going on in this sort of like political structure? It, it, it was something that felt off to me about the movie that especially having to move to all these different locations as per like this sort of like epic storytelling tradition meant it was hard for it to sort of stop and have the kind of like poignance in some ways that I would want from a cyberpunk kind of movie. Yeah, and I, I don't know, you know, some of this is also like, I don't, I don't ever think in like terms of genre like that. And okay. I, I get it. It's obviously it's a huge area of study. It's just not one that, and I don't know much cyberpunk stuff, but like, you know, to me, it's, it's, does the movie work on its own terms or not? And, you know, I, and I'll give you some of that. I absolutely think the lack of like Asian representation in the movie is just weird, like more than anything that there's yeah. not more Asian. I mean, the, the, the AI lady is Asian. Um, and, but like there's, or I think she, I, I think I looked that up, but like, yeah, most of the actors in the movie we see are not obviously. And, you know that's that's it is a weird choice and uh, you know i don't mind so much that we're not down on the, again i think it's so much it is about k's journey and i do think it has the focus where it needs on that but yeah i mean it take yeah so i guess for I me give you all like, that. It's just, it's, I, i'll okay. give you all that it's just not something i needed in the movie I'll i guess that. i will say that like i think that's one of the reasons why k's character arc doesn't work as well for me is that the movie doesn't give me a strong sense of like the broader social context in some places that it could have like like there are glimpses of it here and there that but that don't contribute to this like broader sense of like like what is this kind of like class structure that exists in this society especially because like i think the genre stuff is important for this movie because this movie doesn't exist on its own it does exist in conversation with later on one it does exist in conversation with like where we are as a society now and it's impossible to sort of like remove that and i think there's a lot of stuff that like 
this movie has so much potential to, to to be able to sort of have some of these more sort of like political messages and infuse that a little bit stronger and it feels like it issues that to do this more sort of like universal sort of story that has that like very internal resolution at the end of that character with k that for me feels like almost weirdly problematic in some ways but it's just it to me it's just not what the movie is about and it's not the kind of filmmaker dennis villeneuve is and it's not anything this movie is going for like I, i'll say this like I, I can agree that obviously we don't see a larger social snapshot in the way Blade Runner 1 very much exists as like this fictional society snapshot in that it has a linear story it tells, but it almost feels circular in how much it is about that setting yeah. and that atmosphere, you know? Blade Runner 2049, though, I do think there's like... One of the things I weighs it, I do think it characterizes K early on is through isolation in that, you know, we see him out on a job... And then when he comes home, it's moving as fast as he can through those streets to get back to his little apartment and be completely on his own with his fake girlfriend and his fake food and his fake life and and live there in his little haven. And then he'll go back out so he can get more stuff for that little fake haven. And I think one of the interesting things the plot forces him to do is broaden that horizon beyond he's ever wanted to because he is so emotionally shut down. And one of the ways I do think it... it recontextualizes replicants with how much we see more like, like they are directly controlled by the police station and they have like there's that fascinating thing they do that with Hal from 2001 that asks them the questions about like the baseline thing right. that we see multiple times is that they're like they are very much more beaten down than the replicants we saw in Blade Runner 1 or like the the couple of Nexus 8s we see here like the uh, Dave Bautiste character who he's a great actor yeah he is Bautista like Boy, you would not guess that's the guy who plays Drax the Destroyer. Right. He's Because he, one, he's not that old. Yeah. They really, like, aged him up. But anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent. Um, and so, you know, that's where, like, early on, that's the kind of pool the movie paints in for me is this character who is, you know, told he is a fake, believes he is a fake, has this little life, isolates himself. And I actually think that is something that echoes in kind of society and the place we are in society now is this you know, tunnel vision on our own lives, on our own spaces, uh, on these, you know, fake and artificial experiences we can dive into and be a part of. And that the, as the world gets bigger and denser, the more we are on our own. And I think that's one of the things that I see in Kay early on. And I think it's one of the, the important, like, um, fundamentals the movie is built, foundations the movie is building on from the beginning. For me, like, I just, the movie didn't really affect, like, didn't nail that note to me because I think you don't get this, a strong sense of that contrast of that, like, because, like, you have to, what you have to do in doing that very, like, modernist, you know, like, individual in the city, but you are isolated in your, like, in the sea of humanity is you have, you have to have that sea of humanity. And so much of this movie emphasizes it, like, beautifully it emphasizes these huge, empty, wide, massive open spaces. It's like so much the palette and like style of the movie is like you have these huge, wide open spaces. And sometimes a little bit you get into that, like that part of the city. But it, to me, it was never quite enough to give that sense of that contrast of like, oh, everybody is like in their cubbies, like focused on what's right in front of them because they can't exist in this broader society, which is, you know, a theme I really love. Um, and I, I, but I don't think that this movie... To me, it didn't represent that that well. It's just interesting because I, I think the movie has kind of an obvious disinterest in that part of the world. And I don't mind that. I think it can make whatever choices. It can take whatever it wants from the original. It's making its own thing. Um, but I, I think that disinterest is part of the, uh, to me, part of what, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's a thematic aberration as much as it's just part of what the movie is about. So let's move on to that. I, I do want to talk about some characters. Okay. Because um, you mentioned her earlier. I'll say the one character in the movie that like does not work for me is the Robin Wright character. I love Robin Wright is a really talented actress. Yeah. She's on a different wavelength than other people in this movie. And I, I get some of that in that she's one of the only human presences. And I think there are some scenes where I can see what they're going for in that she feels like she's out of a different movie because she kind of is. But at the same time, it just... Never quite gels with me. She does have the worst and most laborious expositional dialogue. Um, one of the scenes that I would definitely write differently if I were like making this movie, yeah, and it wouldn't be as good a movie if I made it. I don't have that kind of artistic skill, but like if I were, is um, the and it's a key scene is is him talking about his dream with the horse and everything. I don't know why that's revealed in conversation with her. I don't know why that's the choice you'd make as a storyteller, yeah. especially when one of the subsequent scenes you find out that uh, Joy, the AI girlfriend, has heard this story before. 
that needed to be to me like a scene that you do with joy right and yeah. like and and with joy you also that means you have a shorthand and you do it with less dialogue and you do it even more visually and there's nothing labored about it at that especially point. because the robin wright character like dies pretty shortly after that point yes. so it's like she's not even she's not even a significant character in the movie past that point yeah he only needs to unburden himself there to the audience yeah he doesn't need to unburden himself. He, he owes nothing to her. He, and there are little... I think there's interesting performance things she's doing there where there's like this hint of like attraction she has to him. And you can tell that like... Uh, she, you know, there's little things I think Grace notes she's playing and being directed to play about um, how much she feels like kind of, I think, uh, like constricted by this, uh, you know, this system and is trying to like break out of it a little bit with Ryan Gosling. But it, it never comes to the front in a way that makes her an interesting character and again, like, not that th that character didn't need to be in the movie somewhere. Like, I think if you look at Blade Runner 1, the, like, the police chief in that one, too, is on a different wavelength. But he's in yeah. two scenes, I think. Yeah, he's, yeah, exactly. He's in two scenes. And one of those scenes is, like, one of the most weirdly unsettling scenes in that movie where they're watching the, the slideshow. Yeah, yeah. And he's giving details on it. And they're like, you're a freaky dude, man. Like, what the fuck is up with you? Yeah, but it, it feels a little more of the palette of that movie because... Again, it, it doesn't it have as much focus on it. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think the Robin Wright character is emblematic of a, a few scripting issues to me. Yeah. The other character, because like, I basically agree with those. Like, I think she's a... I like her because I like the like actress and I liked her performance. Yeah, yeah. But like, yeah, in terms it's of... It's not like, Robin Wright's fault. Yeah, That's it's not... like the character's role in the script in some places just feels weird. And it is like like that side of the movie that's really only present for like the first 30 minutes or something is like a significant thing. But that police side of it, like that like CSI Blade Runner just felt like... This is like a different. This is like that the the scene where they're in the morgue at the beginning of the movie. How like the this is like the most fucking cliche CSI scene ever. This really you could have paved over this because it feels so unnecessary to most of the movie to like have this much detail in here. Um, but then the other character that like I like kind of, but like for me is a weird character that that ultimately I think didn't work all as the way that she was intended to is the sort of. Terminator-esque lady that's the other, the replicant that's kind of like trying oh, to love. hunt him down. Yeah, for most of the movie. Like, there are parts of the movie where I like her and then parts of the movie where it feels like that, like, it just feels like that character was supposed to have, like, a complication at some point and make some sort of turn. But she's so, like, sort of, like, almost, like, comically villainous at some point. Like, her and, and then the Jared Leto character. But the Jared Leto character is only in two scenes, so it's a bit easier to accept that. But well, like they those... play the Jared Leto character much more like Tyrell in the original in terms of the spaces yeah. he's in. He's elevated. He's in a different plane. Love is out on the streets. Yeah, you know? and and so like they're together. It's particularly it's the scene where they're together. I can't remember. It's another one of the. I can't remember what the line is, but it's another instance in the movie where there's just like a couple of lines of dialogue that are so like weirdly on the nose that feels like should have been massaged where they're together and it's like about like basically they're like plot that's like okay you're gonna have to go after k and stuff after he like murders the the one like replicant lady that that just was born and so the love is like slightly freaked out by that but there's also like this moment where i feel like it's like kind of a lower angle shot on the two of them and he, and and the jared leto character says some sort of like really sort of Saturday morning cartoon villain line and to the point where it felt like there should have been some ridiculous like music scene like bum 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 that plays right there this like what's the line I can't remember what it is because I okay. saw this movie a week ago but like it was I just remember that there was some line there that I saw felt, it again like, yesterday and I don't know what you're talking about it was just it was something where it just felt like a line that exists specifically to let you know that these people are evil in a way that's like you don't need to have this line there that like dramatically punctuates this moment because you already dramatically punctuated the moment by having him fucking kill this replicant lady um it is just a number of instances in the movie where they do that with the dialogue but it also just paints both of those characters as being like ridiculously like kind of just like basic villains and then our she is like you said she's the one that goes out and is actually sort of like enacting um this violence in the world trying to track k down and she's the one who kills the robin wright character and stuff and it kept on feeling to me like she was supposed to get some turn at some point that she, even if she's still the villain, like recognizes something deeper in her villainy or something, but you never get to that point with that character to like, by the time we're at like the end of the movie and she's just sort of like very single-mindedly trying to kill them. I'm just like left like not really into understanding what her motivations are anymore at this point. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I guess I don't disagree with any of that. I didn't. It didn't bother me when I watched the movie. Um, you know, I think she, I do agree that I think her performance 
probably gets less interesting as the movie goes along because I think she does some really interesting stuff early on. Like, again, Wallace has only two scenes and his first scene is the one with love and it's where he's talking about the replicant and he stabs the woman and all that, um, the replicant lady. And what's really interesting, I mean, that whole scene, the point of it is we're watching love's reaction to everything yeah. and the tear in her eye and like the confliction and all these things. And then there's this kind of single-mindedness that follows up. And I don't know. I mean, I, I think you get tones and you get shades out of it at different points about, you know, her single-minded fury in proving that, like, you know, I, I can be this to Mr. Wallace or whatever that is. In I, I think there's some kind of almost maniacal, like, hatred for the idea of this child she's trying to find and, and this, you know. But, but, again, it's shades, it's tones, it's not fully fleshed out notes, I don't think. And it's something that to me, it's like, it's that scene where she sees how, like, she's like directly witness to how awful Wallace is and how much he doesn't give a shit about replicants, how much like he, he will just kill them for nothing because he's, he will just create them and kill them if they are failures to him. That like seeing that and having her like really intense emotional reaction to me, like that felt like that's setting up like some turn later for that character sometime to play I, down the movie. I'll say, I think the one, you know, the, the level I do think she works on is as the counterpoint to Kay of they are both replicants who are, you know, like new generation, very controlled, sent on a mission by the people who own them. And one of them has this emotional awakening over the course of the movie. And one of them stays, you know, really tied to that mission over the course of the movie. And it ends in that, phenomenal sequence in the with up against the seawall and I just this amazing piece of filmmaking I we have to talk about. And, you know, I think there are some things like Roger Deakins does in the cinematography that are amazing there where like, you know, the final part of that of their fight is Kay above the water holding her below the water. And we see from her perspective up on him and his perspective down on her. And I think there is supposed to be a, a dichotomy there, a duality there between these two figures who have, you know, kind of gone to their grave in very different ways but I, I agree there's probably ways you could turn her and i don't mean i wouldn't even say turn i would say just flesh out yeah and something to maybe explain more of where that motivation comes from uh you know there's a line she has at the end after we th she thinks she's killed k where she says i'm the best one that sounds like there was a scene that set that up and i don't know where that line came from right um not that I need not that I need it to be that explicit. Again, I think some of that is in the performance and how it's seen over the course of the film. But yeah, there's there's something missing there probably. Yeah, it just felt a bit too one note, especially because she's she's one of like the most significant like recurring characters mm -hmm. in the movie because she comes up so much. What do you think of uh I mean, I think Harrison Ford is fantastic in this. Yeah. And like Harrison Ford's reunion tour, whatever <laughs> is going on with these me like whether you like the movies or not, he's doing amazing work in them. And I'm yeah. actually really curious if they make this Indiana Jones 5, what that's going to be like. Because if he brings what he to that, what he's brought to Star Wars The Force Awakens and Blade Runner 2049, that's going to be fascinating. Yeah. I mean, because he's not in this movie a ton. And I, I like that. I like yeah. that Deckard, like this is not Deckard's story. Deckard is important to the story, but he is a secondary character. And when we get to him, it feels earned, not fan y and, and I think every choice they make with him actually is not the easy Deckard 30 years later choice. Yeah. I think it's an interesting one. And he is fantastic. It's just, it's just a reminder that Harrison Ford is a hell of an actor. The Watch the last shot of the film where he puts his hand on the glass and is looking at his daughter. And the sheer range of emotions that play over his face in that moment is stunning. It's a yeah. stunning piece of silent acting. And he has some dialogue in this movie, but not a lot. And most of what he's doing is just, I think, amazing, like, silent acting. Yeah, it turns out that if you want to end a Blade Runner movie, just, like, end it by having a really complicated but fascinating expression on Harrison Ford's face and then go to credits. Like, that's what you need to do? Because it yeah. works. Yeah, no, he's, he's really good in the movie. I do like their vision of Deckard. Like, one thing I do like they do is that they they make the, like, Rachel Deckard relationship sort of vague enough in this movie that sort of, like, can account for like the how weird that relationship is in Blade Runner One. Oh, this movie is fully aware of that. Yeah, that like they did not have this like loving relationship. Like I don't, I'm not even sure how much Deckard actually really like cares for Rachel. Like like because you know they they do have that scene where they bring in the like you know D H Sean Young and all that stuff. And I think there's like 
they do a good job at complicating that relationship in the way it needs to be complicated. But I also just like how just utterly washed up and like he's completely alone, like self isolated, just like my life got fucked by the over the course of the that first movie, and it has remained fucked because of how fucked it was. And and he's just off in Las Vegas as like a beekeeper. Um, you know, like Sherlock Holmes when kept bees, Rick Deckard can go keep bees. I just think it's it's a fun, it's a it's an interesting vision of where that character goes. That like you said, it's not just like the easy version of it. No, because like even like one of my favorite stra- I mean, all the stuff in Vegas is stunning, not just visually, but I think how it's paced and given to us. But like when Kay gets there and meets Deckard. One Deckard's first line is quoting, I believe, Long John Silver in Treasure Island. Yeah. Which is, I just, that's one of the, that's probably my favorite piece of dialogue in the movie. Is it's just a fun choice. Because that's not what I expected Harrison Ford to say. But that whole scene, like, it's not they meet and they're like, you know, we're kindred spirits. You know, it's not the easy version of that. It's Harrison Ford shoots Ryan Gosling. And then they have this fight, which is, again, one of my favorite sequences in the movie. Where they're going through, like, the Vegas bar. And these, like, Elvis and Marilyn Monroe things are coming in and out. Yeah. And it keeps threatening to burst into, like, one of those postmodern, like, scored to old music sequences we get so much in movies these days. And it never does. Yeah. And I think it's a really interesting thing. And the only way, like, Kay earns this dude's respect is he takes enough punches. And then they talk. Yeah. And when they talk, things are not, like, answered in a neat bow. Like, all, I think every step in that is really well done. Even, you know, we talked to, when the trailer came out, like, that seems like a weird costume for Deckard to be wearing in Blade Runner 2049. It makes complete sense to me when you see the movie yeah. that he's just, of course he's wearing, like, a shirt and jeans. Like, what else is he going to be? He's been stripped of all these things. Yeah, he, the only thing he has is, like, the stuff that's been left in Vegas, basically. I mean, it's, it's interesting because he is basically a pathetic old man in this. And, you know, the gift Kay gives him in those final moments is some, you know, humanistic reawakening. That, that there's something he actually could still live for and he sees that. Um, but he's very good. And I, and I do think his, other than the last shot, which is an amazing piece of acting, his best scene in the movie is the one, the second scene with Wallace where he's taking him and they, it's a really interesting conversation where I also really like the dialogue in that scene because the way they write Wallace there is so circular and talking around the issues that it it has this very dreamlike quality like the original Blade Runner and I think it also does a really good job how they choose to straddle the line of is Deckard a replicant or not I really like in this movie yeah where where they bring it in is Wallace says like okay Rachel was built to be the replicant who could procreate and it's like okay so that's that's what her purpose was and he has this line about um you know is it you were programmed the same to, to, or is it, you know, your entire programming was to fall in love with her? Is that the reason you were called there that day? And then he says, and then I think Wallace's last line in that section is something like, or maybe it wasn't. And, and like making him question this whole reality. And I think it gives a, a bone to the Deckard is a replicant group. Yeah. But it also gives a bone to the ambiguity is king group because that's what that whole scene is about is that. You know, okay, there was some larger purpose and Wallace is pursuing some larger purpose and there are all these grand machinations and Deckard is at the center of it in this scene because he has some obscure piece of knowledge and his ultimate conclusion, Deckard, like that, that keeps him grounded in that moment is just saying, I know what's real and what's real was whatever I felt there, whatever we had together. It does not, I think, elevate that to like a grand romance. It doesn't denigrate it to nothing. I think yeah. it, it walks a lot of lines interestingly and I even like how they use the D.H. Sean Young in that sequence. And here's why I like it, is I was never sure if that was supposed to be actual Sean Young de-aged or like a stand-in, because the whole point is it doesn't look quite like her. Yeah. Which I actually think is a very savvy use of the de-aging technology, because even at its best, it's, ne- it's always going to be a little eerie. So why not lean into it? Yeah. And they lean into it the right way there. Um, and I like his... As Harrison Ford does a good kiss-off line, and, and his kiss-off line here is, her eyes were green. Yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah. Harrison Ford's really fucking good. Ryan Gosling is news fucking good. News at eleven. Yes. Harrison yeah. Ford is really fucking good. Ryan Gosling also in this movie. Can I don't I can't praise yeah. him enough. He's an amazing actor and he's so good in this. Yeah, he is. Because yeah. I haven't really seen much that he's been in. Like okay. it was something I hadn't realized because it's something where he's so popular and like, you know, yeah. like you see him on posters and like billboards and stuff all the time that I hadn't realized like, wait. Because I haven't seen like Drive, like I, I yeah. didn't see La La Land, like I haven't seen a lot, or I, and I never saw Looper. I, that's one of those movies that I always keep on. He's not reading. in Looper. Is that who's, who's the? That's Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Sorry. Yeah. No worries. But, like yeah, but there's like a, there was one other movie, 
there's just like a couple of his like big movies that it's like I just realized I've never actually I don't think I've seen him in any movies like I've only yeah. seen him on billboards and trailers and in like like weird like He's... half seen clips on YouTube of like an interview that he was a part of Ryan Gosling is a fascinating actor to me because he exists in that same range as uh, Brad Pitt I put in this category too where Brad Pitt and Ryan Gosling are considered like you know huge movie stars right like yeah. everyone knows them but you can't name like the Brad Pitt or Ryan Gosling movie that made like a billion dollars because right. they're they're basically art house actors who sometimes do bigger Hollywood movies but tend to bring those art house sensibilities with them and they just are really really good solid actors almost I think in more of a like you know grand era Hollywood tradition than what we have now not to denigrate modern actors I just yeah. mean that like I think that's the kind of mode they work in and you know if okay I've, I've seen enough Ryan Gosling movies I think I can give you like the Ryan Gosling experience yes. if you want to see his definitive performances I would give you this I would give you a drive and I would give you last year's The Nice Guys by Shane Black okay because Ryan Gosling right. yes that's the other movie I was thinking of because Ryan Gosling is also a crazy person and he is fucking hilarious and he is so funny in The Nice Guys and Russell Crowe is so funny with him that you get Drive and Blade Runner are deathly serious the Nice Guys is deathly silly, and you will enjoy the Ryan Gosling experience across those. And uh, I also liked him in La La Land. Some people like to make fun. He's good in that movie. He's not a good singer, but that's also not quite the point of that movie or his performance. So, okay, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Yeah. Um, yes, but he's very good. You, pro- you wouldn't like La La Land, okay. so. Yeah, <laughs> anyway. it, it doesn't seem like it's the kind of movie. He's, kind of but movie. He's, the Nice I mean, Guys good does, though. That's what I was like. Oh, I mean, you'd love The Nice I, Guys. I've just been meaning to see it. Yeah. It's very good. It's, yeah. The Nice Guys feels like a movie... That you found, like the kind of movie you would find on VHS in the 90s at uh-huh. a local rental shop yeah. and stumble on it and be like, how was this not in my life before? Yeah. That's what it is. Like they, yeah. they should have put that movie out on VHS. It just feels They've like... They've never even given it a theatrical release. It's like, <laughs> you can come to the theater and we'll sell you this VHS tape. Because I... But we're not going to show it here because the box office isn't going to be great. Let's be I, honest. That's even the way I discovered it because... Or not discovered. I knew about the movie. I missed it in theaters because it was in theaters for like a week. And it was one night uh, a cousin and I were together and we were searching for a movie to watch on like the Apple TV. And I was like, oh, they just came out on iTunes. Let's just rent it and watch it. And I was like, this is fucking great. Yeah. That's how I it happened. I really need to see that one. Anyway. Now I have a natural motivated motivation because I know how good an actor Ryan Gosling is from having watched Blade Runner 2049. And he is so... I mean, the, the, the range he has to play in terms yeah. of the size and scope of the arc. You know, and again, I, I, understand, I completely understand your problems with, like, this overall story and scope. But, you, again, like, like I said, it's one of the unimpeachable things about the movie is, is I think Ryan Gosling just... Because so much of it is so internalized. And there's a, there's, I think there's a skill in acting that is undervalued, which is acting through stillness. And Ryan Gosling does a lot of that in this movie. Yeah. Like the scene, the threesome scene, which I think is an amazing like flashpoint scene for the movie. He his face barely moves in that, and yet I think he's doing a lot of acting. I mean, it's it's you can tell someone's a really good actor when ninety percent of their acting is it's one all of their acting is compelling is really compelling, but ninety percent of it is them looking at something. Yes, and that's like ninety percent of his acting in this movie is him just looking at something. Yeah, and and he's very very good and. Yeah, I don't know if I have more to say than that, but yeah. uh, he's great. I think the actress who plays Joy, the AI lady, is... I've, I've not seen her before. I think her name is Anna de Armas or something. She's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the scenes with her are really interesting. But I, I, I really like the effects with that character as well. I think they did a really good job of, like, sort of moving between this interesting, yeah. like, she's holographic and then oh, in some places being more physical, depending on, like, where the story was with her. And if I had to guess, those look like in-camera effects. Like, that... Yeah. Like, uh, one way you could do that is, like, shoot a plate without her there, and then one with her there, and then, like, adjust the opacity, which is, like, half in camera, half not. But that, it looks more like that than, like, they put her on a blue screen or something. Right, yes, yeah. It looks very, t- like, she looks like she's in the space, even if she's see-through. And I don't know how to explain it, but that's a great effect. Yeah. <laughs> like, the ent- again, part of why that threesome scene works so well, and again, I s- suspect this was largely in camera, is how... You have her layered over Mackenzie Davis and like the way these bodies kind of come in and out. Oh, it's an amazing sequence, like avant-garde kind of yeah. art statement. Um, but we haven't talked about the actual star of the movie yet. Like the guy who should have his name on the top of the poster. And that's Roger motherfucking Deacons. Okay, yeah. Jesus. Yes, yeah. Jesus. I mean, if you don't know Roger Deacons' name, you don't pay attention to cinematography because he's one of the kings. To me, it's him and Emmanuel Lubezki are the two best living cinematographers and they're there's a bunch of other ones, but they're at the top. Uh, he has shot almost all of the Coen Brothers movies. 
Um, other films you might know of his, especially recently, um, and I think the best precedent for this one is Skyfall. Oh, yeah. The James yes. Bond movie he shot, which at the time I would have said unquestionably was the best use of digital photography in a movie ever. Since then, we've had some of like uh, Emmanuel Lubezki's run of three Oscars, Birdman, Gravity, and The Revenant would all challenge it for that. Uh, but I would put Blade Runner back on the top of that pile because I think it's it's maybe the best use of digital photography I've seen in a movie. And part of it is like when Deacons shoots digitally, it's unlike anyone else. Like when Lubezki shoots digitally, it's usually to do these experiments with like how much you can move the camera, as in Birdman or some of the later Malick films, or how you can use natural light, such as in The Revenant, which is an, a, an amazing feat of cinematography and I think deserved every inch of that award it won, even if I think the movie is problematic. Roger Deakins does this really interesting thing with digital photography where I feel like he is dead set on not just proving that digital can be 35 millimeters like equal, but that it can in some way surpass it. And I will say Skyfall and Blade Runner 2049 are two of the only times I've sat in a theater and said, cinema might be okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because like, I love the look of film and there's been, look, there's been plenty of great digitally shot movies, but in general, when I go back and see a movie shot on film, there's just something where it's like, oh, look at what we've lost. I don't feel that at all with Deacon's digital work. Yeah. Um, the writer, Christopher Tapley, he writes currently for Variety, has said, and he writes a lot about cinematography, has said that Deacon's going digital was like Bob Dylan going electric, where like it took the core of what he was and exploded it into something bigger than you could have imagined. And I think that's so true about Deacon's digital work. And it's one of those metatextual things I was thinking of is that the, the photography in Blade Runner 2049, in so many areas and how it uses light, and texture and kind of depth of detail and and how the colors are sometimes warm and cool but they all feel like they have so much depth and like you can just like you feel like you can reach out and touch it like this movie has a 3d version out in theaters i don't know why yeah it's all it's in 3d yeah it's just you don't have glasses on you know all of that it, it it's more human than human like it's a thing that like digital is not real in the sense of you can't hold a digital film in your hands there's no film strip and yet he's created something that looks as real or more than many of the great 35 millimeter feats of photography. And that's just a metatextual thing that like kept coming up to me in this film is that it feels like the like K is trying to prove to himself that he has reality. The photography is constantly moving with this confidence that says it has this level of reality. And it's it's a really amazing thing. And just some of the things that are staged, you know, you have some of those landscapes you talked about, like the Vegas ones are obviously very yeah. eye-catching, but I think all the stuff over Los Angeles or in the outskirts. Uh, and then I think one of the best shot scenes in the movie is the seawall scene at the end, the climax, where like just the way the water is cascading and just how clear all the action is, even though it's this very chaotic thing going on and it feels so claustrophobic. And there's these shots where you're from Love's POV under the water looking up. I've never seen water shot like that. Oh man, and just and just little moments of beauty. Like we've seen a, plenty of endings where someone is looking up at snow at the end of a movie. I don't know if I've ever seen it like this with that yeah. kind of just kind of clarity and texture. I I am in love with the look of this movie, and it feels like the most no brainer Oscar winner ever. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. And like and Ro this will be Roger Deakins' seventeenth nomination if he gets it. He has never won. Give yeah. this man a fucking Oscar. Yes, this work is definitely deserving of it because other like standout sequences is like the the opening of the movie like the the flying the panning oh, flying shots over um the sort of like the protein farms or whatever that these like white pods yeah. all over this landscape just yeah it's a constant thing but and it's and it's obviously there's like the big standout like you know sort of like oh fuck off you're just showing off kind of sequences <laughs> it's, which really is. it's like those the trend it's a lot of like the transitions between like big scenes of where you know the flying cars flying from location to location like those are that like you know, you're just showing off moments but it's also just like the meat and potatoes like in Kay's apartment you know and like and just like like normal sort of like dialogue scenes and stuff like that just fantastic he finds it, he finds an interesting way to shoot everything i mean yeah, exactly. again like joy is an effect that works because of cinematography more than anything else yeah. and there are scenes like the one where uh, the early scene where he gets the emanator for her and they go out in the rain together yeah. mm -hmm. oh my god it's an amazing scene and again it's like that's not just empty showmanship. That is style emanating substance to me because those are the yeah. ideas of the movie coming through the visuals, just seeping through the visuals. Uh, another one I noticed when I saw it yesterday is, and this is this is this should be like 
the most nothing like easy to shoot sequence in the movie and he still found an interesting way to do it is when Deckard and Kay sit down and have their conversation at the yeah. bar and it's it's theoretically a simple two shot where we go back and forth between you know Deckard here and Kay here and we come back and forth you know shot reverse shot kind of thing not two shot sorry shot reverse shot yeah and but on each one if you see the movie again pay attention to how he uses depth of field in that because you have Deckard and Kay in the forefront and you have a very shallow depth of field but it's shallow in such a way that the way things blur in the background and with that Las Vegas like orange emanation coming out it looks like they're in front of a, like an impressionist painting it's a fascinating visual effect and it's just something that again adds like something otherworldly or or other to what we're watching and it's it's gorgeous. You can really pick any shot in the movie and, I don't know, write an essay about it. It's, yeah. it's amazing how it's done. And just all the different ways that he, you know, realizes the different sort of, like, spaces in the yeah. movie. Like, you know, Kay's apartment versus where Wallace is and, like, everything with, like, that whole facility versus, like, you know, the, the sort of, like, child slave labor camp and stuff like that. All those areas. And, and then, obviously, like, the whole Las Vegas sequence and the color palette there and the way it's shot there. He, he brings a sort of like sense of style and texture to all these different locations that feel unique and build on one another as the movie goes. You know, like I don't really give a shit about the box office of the movie. I could have told you it was going to probably bomb no yeah. matter what. And I, and I actually think for what it is, I'm, I'm slightly impressed it did as well as it did. But um, the only thing that makes me slightly sad about that is that probably decreases the chances of this movie getting Oscar recognition. And it needs that cinematography Oscar. Yeah. It should at least get sound nominations. I mean, yeah. Dunkirk should win those, but it should get the score needs a nomination. Production design, obviously. Yeah. Um, you know, makeup and hairstyling, maybe. There's a bunch of technical ones you could do, a la, like, this should sweep those like Mad Max Fury Road did, frankly. Right, yes. But then, yeah. like, I would also, you know, say Ryan Gosling probably deserves to get in. He won't, but that would be interesting. Harrison Ford should be in the conversation. Um, you know, I would say Dennis Villeneuve for director would not be unwarranted. He's especially, I mean, this is the best movie I've seen this year. I, there's a lot to come, but you know, anyway, uh, just getting back on track. It's just, yeah. I am a cinematography nerd. I love this stuff. The one Oscar category I do care passionately about is the cinematography Oscar. One, because they usually get it right <laughs> or at least close to right. Because it's like, and it's one of those, it's like, it's, it's, it's a thing that you can like really tell from watching the movie, but it's also like design and production enough that most people don't really give a shit or really even understand what it is, that there's, like, less of the politics behind it. Yes, I think that's true. And it's an interesting, interesting category. Like, it tends to be every year. Like, the five, they might not be exactly the five I pick, but I'm like, yeah, those are five amazing feats. And, you know, you have years where, like, The Revenant is up against Mad Max Fury Road, and it's like, I, I think I probably would pick The Revenant too, but that's just great that we have that competition. I didn't realize they are making a sequel. Oh, no, the not The Revenant, Revenant too. <laughs> That'd be a little weird, but yeah. He fights another bear. Like and... these fucking bears. God damn it. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, I I do think cinematography is probably the place to start wrapping this up. Although I'll say yeah. with that, I did a little tweet thread about this earlier and, and I just want to mention it. The, the score by Hans Zimmer and Benjamin Wallfish is amazing. Yeah. The more you like listen to the soundtrack and see the movie again, the more you realize that it is operating at a depth uh, in relation to the visuals that I think is really profound and stunning. Like... Again, one of the reasons that seawall sequence is so amazing to me is how synesthetic it is. Like, the music sounds like waves crashing, and it has this kind of sense of, like, techno-violence that mirrors the, the, the harshness of the imagery. And it's just, it's constant like that through the whole movie. You know, I'm not yeah. going to say it's the superior to the Vangelis score, because it, it's, it's borrowing too much from that for that to be the case, but it is a great score on its own merits yeah. and I think that's a kind of amazing thing and I would say the same thing about the movie you can't say this is a better film than Blade Runner 1 it's actually hard to compare them in a lot of yeah, ways they're very different but but you know it exists in the shadow and yet it also becomes its own thing and you know we have some different thoughts on it but this has been a really interesting engaging conversation yeah. and I love that I, I love that you could make a Blade Runner sequel in 2017 and it, it elides almost all the risks I would say a Blade Runner in 2017 would maybe hit, like making it an action movie or something. And not only that, it allows us to have an intellectually engaged conversation. Yeah, because it is definitely, it's one of those things that we always have to, when we're having one of these podcasts, you have to stop and like recognize that like the, the ability to have this conversation at all means that like the movie has cleared a certain bar of oh, quality yeah, yeah. in like every single margin. But yeah, it is that like, 
the production side of it in the cinematography is the stuff about the movie that is and and then like a lot of like the acting as well utterly unimpeachable i think like the sound design in the movie is also fucking fantastic i mean like That's... sci-fi movies are where sound design artists like get to show off the most also of, like it's actually why Hans zimmer was important for this because um johan johansson was originally going to score this he scored dennis villeneuve's other movies at some point Hans zimmer was brought on to help because i guess the the sound team like couldn't get the sounds of the Vangela score right. Like they couldn't figure out the soundscape. And Hans Zimmer, in addition to being an amazing composer, is an amazing sound engineer. Yeah. Like he's built whole sound libraries and stuff. And uh, my brother, who's, who's a composer and saw this with me, he he said Hans Zimmer probably did not score most of this movie. Like it's probably Benjamin Walfish, who's one of the guys in his studio. Like it doesn't really sound like Zimmer, but Zimmer was probably instrumental in just getting the sound of this movie up and running. And it yeah. is amazing that it sounds the way it does. Yeah. But if you're working with, you know, samples and synths from 1982, uh-huh. that's not easy to recreate. Yeah, and like like just updating some of like the the like the gunshot sound effect which is so iconic from Blade Runner, but then also yeah. like I've like I just love like sound effects for like sci-fi hover vehicles. It's yes. one of my favorite things. It's one of the things that's always been fantastic about Star Wars. It's m- maybe actually secretly the best part of episode 1, The Phantom Menace is the pod racing sound effects. Yeah, oh. actually, like maybe actually, like if people talk about the Darth Maul like fight scene and like the John Williams score is really good. It's really actually just just the sound design of the pod racing um, is really fucking good. Or like Destiny, one of my favorite yes. things is still just using the sparrow because yeah. it yeah it sounds like a pod. Yes, from that was Star Wars. another one of mine. Just like I think that's where you get to have all these interesting sort of sound effects and the sound effects of the flying cars in Blade Runner twenty forty nine are awesome. One other thing I want to talk about because since you just very recently rewatched this movie, maybe you noticed this because it was something that I can't remember the specifics of like how the shot came about but it's near the end of the movie and there's this really beautiful like match shot that happens of where there's like because i don't remember what the scene is that immediately like precedes this i know what you're talking about but it's there are these embers from a fire that are going up or something like that that then is matched and the embers are matched with the lights of the city remember that shot that yeah yeah the ember i who the, isn't the ember scene after he finds the horse, or is it later in the movie? I can't remember specifically where it is. Like I just remembered, like I just remembered that shot. Like that's a, that match shot. That match shot is amazing, and they echo it later with uh, in the last scene when he's lying in the snow, dying. You match it to her making a snow dream. Yeah, and you know a lot of themes come into play, including some bad fan theories. But like, yeah, yeah. But that's like that thing of like that match shot of the embers like turning into the lights of the city, or like a. You took it from 2001. You did it like that's the one of like you did it. Now like if I was like in a class and I was like we're going to talk about some like basic kinds of cuts. Here's what a match cut is. Instead of going to the very easy 2001 match cut of the bone going to the satellite weapon station. I would go to that one and be like look at this fucking thing. This is amazing. What you know what, when this comes out on Blu-ray, I want to buy it and just watch it for that match cut, and we can talk about it on the podcast. It's really fucking yeah. good. It's yeah. really like it's a it's a small, weird, dirty detail, but I was just like that. Was like, oh man, yes, like that's so because you just don't you don't get that kind of cut that often. But then also like there was just like it's such a beautiful transition of like of like sort of like you know reflecting that fire into like the lights of the city. Yeah, and it's. I actually like the comparison to 2001 because 2001 is a directly associative, like, textual match shot. Yeah. And this is a much more art, like, artsy, you yeah. know, like, uh, thematically associative match shot. Yeah. But they're both, like, very clear match shots yes. that also are, like, are really impressive. Yeah. No, I, it's stunning. Uh, two other things I want to talk about. Uh, one is I have seen this movie in both standard 235 to 1 and IMAX, and I wanted to talk about that because it's interesting. They have not advertised this. The IMAX movie opens the mat. Like, it's, huh. a, it's a taller version of the movie. So the film, the standard version is 235 to 1, which is just standard widescreen. We also call that scope. So you know that aspect ratio well. But what they've done is for IMAX, they've opened, um, opened the mat. just means they've uh, heightened the image. They haven't cropped it. They've, take, they've shown you more above and below. So it's now to 1.9 to 1 which is close to a widescreen TV, and it's the aspect ratio of digital IMAX. Uh, Roger Deakins also did this for Skyfall. So right. I guess... And it's it's easier to do that with digital because you can shoot however much you want and all that. Um, and obviously, if you're doing effects, you don't just do what's in the image. You kind of have to extend things out. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. Like, I... Um, 
I saw it twice. The, the thing is, the way I saw it the first time in 235 was on the, my favorite theater in the world, which is called the Cine Capri. It's uh, the Harkins Theater chain has this. I have to drive a little bit for it, but it's worth it. It's the biggest screen in Colorado. It's 70 feet diagonally, and it's got a Dolby Atmos system. It's amazing. And the movie there looked perfect and immersive, and they've got this beautiful you know, digital projector. I've never had a bad presentation there. It's utterly perfect. And IMAX is not because IMAX digital projectors are from the year like 2009. Right. And they're in 2K, which is Blu-ray resolution, and they look like shit. But I was curious, like, I want to see that different IMAX presentation. And IMAX is still big, and it's got good sound and everything. So I did go to see it. Didn't look as good as the Cine Capri um, because, again, it's literally half the resolution. And the projector was slightly out of focus because if you go to a Regal Cinemas, I think they contractually have to have the projector slightly out of focus. It's a weird thing. Um, I mean, they have to make sure that they just ruin the theatrical experience for as many people as possible. It's just like, I don't know why. I don't know. Someone who runs, like, most theater chains, or the people who run most theater chains just seem to hate movie theaters. It's a weird thing. But it was interesting to see it with that heightened aspect ratio. What that does for IMAX is you're working at a size that it opens it up, and you still, like, your eyes tend to go to the same places it would go in 235 to 1. You're not, like, supposed to be looking at that extra space, but it sort of gives you this sense of visual immersion. Uh, and it is interesting, because you definitely notice that it's a looser framing, that, like, you know, he cut it, 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 it cropped to 235 to 1 to a, for a reason. Like, you didn't need to see Ryan Gosling's entire body. They cut it the right. knees for a reason. But it is just, it's super fascinating. You get to see more corners of the world, um, I hope they include that framing on the Blu-ray. I would love, like, disc one is the definitive 235, and disc two is, like, the IMAX version. Just because, why not? Yeah. And you'd get both framings, and it might look cool on your TV. Uh, and it would be interesting to compare and contrast, because there are some scenes that I think really benefited from it, like the scene in the rain with the emanator with Joy for the first time. There's something about the height, like, when she looks up and the rain coming down, that really, like, the size of IMAX was beautiful, and there's some others... And there's definitely scenes where 235 to 1 felt more necessary. But, um, you know, if you have an IMAX in your town and you're interested in seeing that version, I would recommend it. With the caveat that if you have a theater that's a really good 235 to 1 theater, I would still prefer that. But some towns might not have that. <laughs> and IMAX might be good. Although IMAX is expensive. But, yeah, I, I loved this movie enough that I swallowed the $20 ticket price. Well, yeah. Fucking IMAX. I don't know how... Again, IMAX, upgrade your projectors, you fucking cheapskates. Why? The, I, you don't go see a 2K... This is just I stupid. think they're betting that like theaters won't exist by the time they like have to update their yeah. projectors all the way. They're like they're writing that to his absolute limit. And they might be right, who knows. But what a theatrical experience, right? Like, yeah, you have yes. to see this it. is the movie that's definitely best seen in theaters. Like, it's, yeah. it's you know, that, like... Because, you know, my quibbles with, like, the storytelling stuff aside, which, like, you know, are issues that I do have with the movie, the, that stuff of, like, the cinematography and just that sense of, like, those scenes, like, even if I think, like, the, the length of the movie is a bit much and stuff like that, moment to moment the movie is so fantastic. The, the acting is phenomenal. The, like, everything about the production design is amazing. The cinematography is amazing. And it is, like, again, even though I have some issues with the story telling stuff there are a lot of really interesting ideas that the movie brings up and a lot of the interesting sort of thematic spaces they go to even if i wish that they sort of like went a bit deeper in some of those places the fact that they broached those places at all is something that a lot of movies never even get to blade runner 2049 it reinforces my notion my theory that i'm going to have to write about in the year 2019 that there we if we survive if we survive we have to have that asterisk there asterisk uh, if we survive please don't nuke north korea donald trump um, or vice versa, I guess, um, that I think the most artistically significant American film genre of the 2010s was sci-fi. Yeah. I think yeah. it is it's kind of... a great period for sci-fi. Great period for sci-fi. I mean, you go, you've go, you got Her and Gravity and The Martian and Arrival and Blade Runner 2049. All of those movies like came out in successive Octobers and a bunch I'm probably forgetting about. It's just... And then just like a bunch of like weirder, small like sci-fi, yeah. like like Edge of Tomorrow and like Tom Cruise had like a whole like series of like just making weird sci-fi movies that are like not necessarily, you know, not as good as something like yeah. Blade Runner 2049, but are like good, interesting yes. movies in their own right. And there's a bunch of indie ones that I could list off, um, you know, it, it's this and then ones that are like sci-fi adjacent just depends on where we rank Mad Max Fury Road, but sure, like yeah. you know, it's it's been a it's been a really I think significant period for sci-fi to the point where Blade Runner twenty forty nine brought up associations with recent sci-fi movies like Her, yeah, her yeah. which has a threesome scene very similar to this, and I don't think it's like one ripped off the other. It's just 
there's some ideas in the air and sci-fi is doing a really good job exploring those it's it's what i think american film has done best in the 2010s yeah thinking about we're, we need to wrap this up so i don't want to go too deep into this but you just saying that reminded me of something that i found really interesting about the movie that i don't know if anyone else has had this reaction because i haven't seen that much of it online but the movie that Blade Runner 2049 reminded me of more than any other movie is Steven Spielberg's AI. Do you, I, do you, I, does that make any sense to you or am I a crazy person? I tweeted about that. You did? I, I said, I didn't like, I was doing okay. it like, it was kind of an illusion, but I said, this has shades of, and I listed a bunch of film, filmmakers and I said, and even Spielberg. And what I meant there was AI. Okay. Because yeah, no, I, and, and I think, yeah, I mean, there's something about the wide-eyed way Spielberg looks at sci-fi but also I think the hard edge he brought to it with AI and Minority Report and his 2000 sci-fi which I actually think is a precursor to a lot of 2010 sci-fi yeah. a- absolutely I think and it's also so because AI is also like, like a Cooper. hero's hero's journey like um sort of like a like artificial life yeah. form trying to think no it's of, like, very much path. it's very much got yeah. shades of AI and that AI is also explicitly like a fairy tale Pinocchio kind of yeah. thing I also think it's interesting that AI was this crossroads where it was a Kubrick script right. that Spielberg shot, but it still has so much Kubrick in it. And I think there's a lot of Kubrickian aesthetics in Blade Runner 2049, even though I would not call it a Kubrickian movie yeah. much at all. But yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah. all... Again, I think, I think you're absolutely right about Spielberg. I think there's some Kubrick. I think Andre Tarkovsky, you can't talk about this movie without talking about. And of course, like old school Ridley Scott, who, yeah. thank God he didn't direct this. <laughs> Because oh, that's the God, thing. Yeah. If the Ridley Scott who made Prometheus directed this, you would just get the straight narrative version of Blade Runner twenty forty nine, yeah, and it yeah, wouldn't yeah, be interesting. Right. I mean, that's where like you, if if this if this movie actually does have a very rough screenplay, which is something that's kind of can be hard to tell yeah, just yeah. by seeing the movie. But if it did, you would definitely know if Ridley Scott directed it because yeah. that's like one of the things with Prometheus. You're like. Oh, like you did. Like Ridley Scott was not able to pave over any of the issues in this. And Prometheus like, is all. a well-directed movie. I don't yeah. want to be too down on it. Alien Covenant too, but like, yeah, it's there's just is... some things that some filmmakers are good at, and some things that they're not good at. And like dealing with like screenplay issues is not one of Ridley Scott's like bright points as a director anymore. <laughs> Once anymore. upon a yes. time, but, but like also yeah. like the screenplay for Alien and Blade Runner, are fantastic yeah, yeah. screenplay. Sure, yeah, so. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's. Yeah, so anyways, there are so many things we could talk about. This has been a three and a half hour podcast. I'm happy we got to do this again. Yeah. Uh, Sean, it's it's go time from here to the end of the year. Next week, yeah. I'm playing Fire Emblem Warriors. Right, yes. Two right, weeks from yes. now, I'm playing Super Mario Odyssey. You're playing Wolfenstein 2 at some point. Yeah, I'm that's still, I'm, I'm playing Neo and I'll, we'll have to talk about that in more depth because that's a great game. We've got so much stuff to talk about. We're going to do our Doctor Who bonus that'll be out sometime next week with the next podcast. Um, so much good stuff uh, coming your way and uh, I'm excited to talk about it all. Yeah. I'm just still sitting here thinking like, fuck, are we, if we're going to make it to the year 2049, I'm still sitting here thinking like, are we going to make it to 2019? Will we be able to have all the dumb Blade Runner memes because we made it to the year 2019? My bets are maybe. <laughs>